Hey, everybody. It's us again. Uh, hopefully. Oh, shit. It's lagging again. God it's damn lagging. it. We're going to have to. I was watching this video because, like, I actually do try to improve this shit as ramshackle as it sometimes It appears. looks really dark, too. Yeah. Why does it look so dark? That's oh, strange. Oh, that one is. That, that light isn't on up there. Oh, shit. Why is it? Oh, oh. Did I, I forget know. to plug it in? Or yeah, I guess it, you did. Or Pookie unplugged. I don't think Pookie unplugged it, even though she was up here fiddle farting around. There you yeah, go. Well, that's much better. There you go. Not bad. Well, shit, I just, I recorded a video like earlier, like for another thing. And, like yeah, I didn't even notice. Shit. No, it came out. Okay. Did it? Oh. it was, it was atmospheric. That's what I'm going to, that's how I'm going to play it. <laughs> I'm going to see how, how much this shit lags. Yeah. It, I was reading the thing. I was watching a video the other day and they were saying, well, nine times out of 10, like when live streaming is uh, lagging, it's because you're using Wi-Fi. You're actually technically supposed to plug the ethernet cable into the laptop or the computer that, and i'm just like really uh do we have cable somewhere yeah they got probably, one out in the garage somewhere there's probably one somewhere or like in a drawer in my office i don't know we'll figure it out i don't even know i don't think we have one long enough like to go to get no to it's it. long oh I got, is it? yeah I got, if i if it's still out there if i didn't throw it away then it's long yeah because we. Just, i had a shit ton of fucking computer shit i threw away well, yeah, because we didn't need it anymore. Because it was from like fucking the mid two thousands or some shit. Yeah, there may there may be <laughs> there may be a box of some old stuff still out there. I mean, not, in, the, just buy in the bottom drawer of this desk right here, there yeah. is like a bag that just has like some random cords and shit. So there might be one in there. I don't really yeah. remember. It might help, but hopefully, it won't bother people too much. I'm just like I said, I can't. You know, us usually I'm like looking at myself like on the screen, so I don't do anything like spazzy or anything or if like my hair gets fucked up or i have a booger or something so it's like Booger's. i don't yeah well you know yeah, shit, ha shit happens mm. um you know i don't I don't know <clears throat> you, do you know what i did earlier yeah. speaking of like having stupid shit on your face this, this is how um nothing that i ever do like goes correctly like for some reason i could like make a mess like doing anything i was painting my fucking fingernails this morning right because they you know they were all chipped and whatnot so i paint them this morning I thought they were kind of dry. So you know how you kind of like wave your hands like that, like to dry the nail polish. So apparently this nail polish was so fucking wet that it like fleck and it got like all over my fucking face. So I have red nail polish, like splattered all over my face, like blood stains. And I was like, really, mm. really? That's how my day was going like earlier. The day went fine. Uh, that's what I'm just saying. <laughs> all right. Today, today is going to be a, um, a good sci-fi fucking this is a, a fun show. show well it's just right. kind of like we have had this guy has been uh recommended like by a lot of people and we talked about him a little bit when we talked about alistair crowley um maybe we might have talked about him a little bit when we talked about like scientology and l ron hubbard and stuff because there's like some kind of intersection going on there but a lot of people said oh please you need to do a show about jack parsons and i knew a little bit about him but not a shit ton so like i started researching him and this guy is super fascinating he's a fascinating fascinating person an occult rocket scientist yeah trying, yeah kind of crazy to, but in a fun way yeah, yeah he knew a lot of people he knew uh anton LeVay. he knew uh fucking l ron hubbard and um l ron hubbard fucked him out of money yeah and out of his wife i think uh yes yeah yeah and then uh um, well his girl i guess it was his girlfriend i don't remember if they yeah were they were trying to bring out you know they were trying to bring extra dimensional beings into the world fucking like you do i think um i think jack parsons even blew himself up didn't he he did yeah yeah yeah, yeah. All right, we, we're going to get into that. <laughs> There's like some conspiracy theories. Yeah, about that. I don't know. If, around rocket fuel. All I don't time. know if I buy them. Well, he blew up a lot of things. Yeah. Um, not always on purpose. But the the thing about him though is like he always he struck me as one of he's like a mad genius type of person. He's just like one of those people who's just so out of his own time, and he's just like so out there. But sometimes you kind of need that, like to be because he was like way ahead of his time. Like what the fuck? I mean, when he first started talking about sending men to the moon like rockets to the moon this was like back in the early 20th century when that was still like science fiction like even yeah. the government was like fuck that's crazy no one's gonna go to the moon yeah, what are you talking it. about yeah. yeah and it's like it didn't even take as long so he was like way ahead of his time but he was also kind of a lunatic but not in a bad way like in a way that i would have probably liked to hang out with him type of way because he seemed like a fun dude <laughs> i'm just saying 
Werner von Braun and all them guys. In the he knew that. Nazis. Yeah, he yeah. corresponded with them. Yeah, yeah. and uh, like about the were, about science. Even were, though he was very, I mean, Jack Parsons was very, 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 very anti-Nazi. Yeah, they were trying. They were talking about going to the moon though, too, and putting up putting up um, uh, space stations and shit. They were talking about that all the way in the late thirties. Yeah, they knew about it. It's just that most people couldn't accept it as a reality. There was only like cutting edge guys understood that, that yeah, you could you could leave, you know, the Earth's gravitational pull and put shit in the fucking orbit. Yeah, definitely. You know, they knew about that. It's just that the average person didn't. It's weird. They were like you said, they're kind of ahead of their time. Yeah, it just seemed uh, to to normal people, it just seemed like it seemed science crazy. fiction, like right. it seemed like a crazy idea. So if you were talking about it, like people just thought you were a nutcase. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was kind of laughing earlier, like because before, but just right before we went live, and Thomas Carlyle made the made the uh, comment up there. It's like that he watched Santa Sangre this morning, and he yeah. felt like his brain was fried. Because I just put, I just put the review for that up yesterday. <laughs> I got part of the way through it, you know, until I started give. I gave up on it. it <laughs> He's like, this is too weird. Said, for this is too fucking weird. For me. <laughs> I liked it for about fifteen minutes. It's kind of like <laughs> watching a musical or something, uh, or a play. And it just got weirder and weirder and weirder. And I was like, man, fuck this. I, just, I walked away from it. There, there, there's only so much a man can take. You know what I'm talking about? There's only so much a man only can take. Only so much weirdness. Yeah, he like, has a weirdness quota. A weirdness yeah. limit. Once he reaches it. And it's not very, t It's a, you know, if it was like a bottle, it would only be like that big. And then like once he gets over and then it flows in. Yes. It depends on what it is. It, it depends. It depends on what it was. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Just, in, in that particular case, I was just, no. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like watching a Salvador Dali movie. Well, you yeah. Know? Well, he was a big influence was on yeah, that Al Alejandro okay. Jodorowsky. Yeah. He, yeah, he was really tell. into Dali and all the... And, uh, it's absurdist and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was like really into that scene. Yeah. Um, so you can see like that influence. Yeah. Although, like I said, the movie does actually makes sense there is like a story and shit it's not like it's just a bunch of random images well you yeah know what i mean know. it's just that it gets to the point where i don't care you know <laughs> oracle says tom's tolerance for weird versus his tolerance for booze <laughs> oh yeah exactly <laughs> exactly well what it is is that it, my tolerance of weird starts get, it starts getting where i don't care what about what the message is you know what i mean i feel like they're just taking the piss and you know what i mean i'm like all right you got me you know i gotta go it's kind of like I've been, you know, bamboozled into watching it. That's <laughs> what I feel like. I feel like they're fucking with me. You know, it's just, right. no one's fucking. You with won. You. you got me. No I, one's I watched it. You. I, you know, I watched 15 minutes of it. You that, got that seems like a really funny. Out. That's how I take it. I mean, the movie is like from 1989. No one's yeah. actively fucking with you. I know that. It's just. I'm just... <laughs> it's like a mind. I, well, like the a thing mind about well, the thing about movies though is that. You can watch them or not. So it's not like anyone's trying to like force you to watch them. I know, yeah. You know what I mean? That's why I walk away from it when it starts going right. that way. I like that. I would have liked to see I would have liked to have seen his version of Dune though. Well, everybody wanted to see that because yeah. that would have been crazy pants. Probably would have made me mad also though. Not like the movie made me mad though. I didn't really get mad. It's just that I felt like I was wasting my time. I didn't think that the message was important. That's what I thought. Yeah, I don't even you know, know if I'd so much call it a message. Is this like the theme of? Yeah, it? well, like I said, I just, I just can't take it. You know, can't take it. <laughs> I just, I can't fuck this. Well, the one, well, the the movie that we're doing for the next retrospective, we've already seen it, and I know you like it. Although some people said, some people said that they couldn't handle color from out, color from outer space. The color out of space. The color out of space. Yeah, that's not even that weird. That wasn't that weird. I mean. I was just, I was I've seen with way it. weirder shit. I was rolling that. with it. You know, I was like, all right. I've seen way weirder shit. And then Mandy. That's like, I thought, you know, Mandy's kind of weird, but I fucking like that one. That's what I mean. It's like, I don't know. I just, I have a high tolerance for weird movies. And I've seen like really, really, really bizarre movies. So it's like something like Mandy or something like that, while weird doesn't strike me as like all that weird. Well, when you understand LSD, Mandy isn't that weird. Well, it's not it's weird about, at all. It's about weaponized LSD. That's one of the characters. <laughs> so you know that the you know that that you're tripping when you're watching this movie, you right? Know? And you, you go, okay, yeah, I understand what's going on. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Even if I even if I didn't have experience with LSD, I would probably still have liked it though. Yeah, it's a good movie because you don't. I mean, I I used to like surrealist movies like even before I had ever done LSD. It wasn't that surreal? It was just kind of a hallucination. 
a horror hallucination. Yeah. And it was mostly like a visual yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, it made sense though. Yeah, it totally did. Well, well, like I said, it was just a revenge story. I mean, it was very, the plot was very simple. Yeah. So let's do some shout outs. Yeah. Shall we? Yeah, they're thanking us for the shirts. Oh, good. I'm glad you guys like uh, have got them. I, yeah. I saw, I got pictures and stuff like that from some people that said that they had got them already. Yeah. Um, they've all, I think they've all been sent out at this point, right? Yeah, they're all out. Um, but you know, some people may have to, got them yet, though. yeah, some, I'm sure like, cause a lot of like people in the U S have got them, but I don't know how long the, the international stuff is going to take. Cause I know I had a whole bunch going to the UK and I think I had one or two going to Australia as well. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Just let me know if you get them because you know, all right. So, uh, let's see who we have a new patron this week. I think I mentioned him on one of the matinee shows, but. He, I haven't mentioned him on the main show yet. So uh, welcome, Darren. Thank you very much for your support. Also wanted to give another thank you to Louie and to Sophie for sending us a whole bunch of movies. Yeah. Uh, we got a whole, yeah, a whole bunch I got of Blu rays. Like 15, 15 movies. We watch. have a whole stack like in yeah. front of their TV that we got to get through. Yeah. <laughs> They're all good ones, too. Yeah, I know. And like, well, and the thing is, too, it's like we, I try to watch them, but it's like there's all, I, you know, I try to watch stuff from the matinee show, too, because other night I had to watch, well, I didn't have to watch, I wanted to watch it. But the thing we're going to be reviewing tomorrow, the documentary. Yeah. So I had to watch that, and I'm going to tell you right now, the documentary is like more than five hours long, and I sat there and watched every fucking, I couldn't handle it. Every fucking it was minute too long. of that shit. I liked it, but it was too One long. sitting. Yeah. Because that's just how it should have been in three parts, I think. Man. We'll talk. About I didn't. That. I didn't have a. Tr I didn't have trouble watching through the yeah. whole thing at all. Because what? But you know, I find that stuff really interesting. So, mm. um, also my uh, short story collection, Hopeful Monsters. The first edition of that came out in two thousand nine, but I just recently did a second edition, um, and I added four stories to it, and it is out now in all formats: print format, ebook format, and audiobook format. I finally, finally did an audiobook version of it, which I had never done before. I also have some free codes for the audiobook. I think I have 25 of them. Um, so if you want one, it's going to be first come, first serve. You probably should email me or contact me on Facebook or Instagram or something like that if you want one of the codes. Um, I'm not sure. I think, I don't know if they work overseas because I know that like some people from the UK and stuff like that had had problems like they had to you know they had to make like a u.s audible account like for to use it yeah so i'm not real sure like i don't know like i have to look at the codes because some of them might work for uk i'm not really sure if they've sorted that out by now because that's, that's like a pain in the ass but um i'll just i'll try and figure it out but if you want one just email me or contact me on social media and uh we'll try to sort that out like i said i think i only have 25 of them so it's going to be first come first serve uh, also my card decks, which I think I showed before, uh, it's four different card decks, Edgar Allan Poe, um, ancient Egypt, ancient Greek. And I did like art nouveau absinthe looking ones. Those are now available on the game crafter. It's under my, uh, my account, which is called Giallo games, which I'm probably going to change up because most of the games that I designed at first were Giallo based, but now I'm kind of like doing other like broader horror games and stuff as well. So I might change the name, but I, I don't know. But it's still under Giallo Games at the moment. Also, I wanted to mention, and I think I might have mentioned this before, I am going to start doing a weekly horror book review. I'll probably put them up on Thursdays. I'm not sure when I'm going to start putting them up. I actually recorded the first one today, but I wanted to get like a few ahead because like I said, I want to make sure that I have time to like read the books and you know, have them come because I ordered like a shit ton of books and I have like Kindle Unlimited account so I can, there's like a shit ton of books on there that I want to have this huge list. So I have like a, already have a year's worth of fucking books that I want to review. But I'll let you guys know when I'm going to start putting them up. But I did do the first one today and I'm kind of excited about it because I've yeah. been wanting to get back into reading some horror fiction. So that'll be fun. Okay. All right. So you want to start talking about Jack Parsons? Yeah. You talk about that. <laughs> Oh, Thomas Carlyle says, is Tusk a film? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a film. It's a film made by uh, Kevin Smith. Yeah. Of Clerks fame. And... Um, That's an upsetting movie, man. 
Yeah, it, it's a love it or hate it. I will say that. Yeah. I loved it. I thought I liked, I, it, yeah. I, I liked it a lot. Yeah. But I think it's best to go into it not knowing anything about not it. Not knowing anything. Because about I didn't know anything about it yeah. when I watched it. All I knew was the title and that a friend of ours recommended it. It was yeah. like, you need to see that shit. It's fucked up. So I watched it. So I had no idea where it was going. It's a weird ass fucking movie. It's so weird. It's so weird. Yeah. And like I said, how you feel about it is going to, I don't know. I guess that's true of any movie. How you yeah. feel about it's going to, depend on like how you feel about certain i don't know it's it's a very strange strange movie. yeah i haven't seen the uh, i haven't seen yoga hosers um what's that that's like kevin smith's other movie that he made before tusk okay it's not they're not really like related mm. exactly they're kind of like a loose trilogy i think he was making one that's like supposed to be the third one in the trilogy called i think it's called moose jaw or something like that but i don't know if that one's done yet but yeah, Tusk is super weird. I'll have to watch Yoga Hosers one of these days, even though I've heard that it's really, really bad. So I don't really, I don't know. <laughs> Tusk isn't a bad movie. It's a good movie. It's just I like it's, I it's, liked Tusk yeah, a lot, it's just but it's, it's really weird. Yeah, it's fucking pretty disoriented because you run into some crazy motherfuckers with a weird ideas. <laughs> weird idea that he makes a reality. Yeah, that's and, all. That's all we're gonna say. Yeah. <laughs> We should do a review of it. One of I liked days. it. I liked it too. I liked like, it too. But I, after I got done with it, I was like, "Man, that was really fucked up." Yeah. yeah. Well, the end of it like really kind of upset me because I could kind of feel. I mean, it's a re it's ridiculous, but yeah. then if you think about it, you're just kind of like, "Oh shit!" It's kind of like one of those things. Remember when we were talking about when we reviewed Return of the Living Dead, and I was like, "It's a ridiculous movie. It's a horror comedy." But if you think about the premise behind it, that like the zombies can still feel what it's like to be dead. Yeah. I mean, I'm like, that's really existentially disturbing. Like if you think about it, even though it's just like a goofy movie with Linnea Quigley being naked in it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So she this was, is, she was actually the best part of the movie. She, well, that's what everybody just, says. She's fucking just hot. hot <laughs> and that was like at, at, at her fucking optimum hotness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also she was, was she even wearing pants. I don't think she was. No, what I think yeah. they ended up doing though was I think they made her like essentially a plastic Barbie crotch. Okay. Um, right. Because I guess they were offended. I mean, this is the 80s, so everyone still had pubic hair. Yeah. Um, but I guess they didn't want to show pubic hair for whatever reason because she didn't give a shit. Right. But I think they made her like this weird molded because I think she okay. was talking so about it. So she did like, have clothes some... on, kind of. Sort of. Sort of. Okay. Sort of. Didn't I just... look like it. Yeah. yeah, but you know, she would get. She was in Silent Night, Deadly Night. You know, mm -hmm. she got with the tits and she got like impaled on the antlers, and yeah, she was in fucking uh, Night of the Demons, right, where she was like in that pink dress and she's like yeah. leaning over with her butt sticking out in the yeah. convenience store. She was very and sticking the lipstick in her tit and sorority babes right. and slime ball bullorama. You know what I mean? So, all right, so let's talk about Jack Parsons now. Jack Parsons. So you're was, ready to start the show now. Yes. Now you're ready to start the show. Well, okay. why? Yeah. Just, all right. Why are you not Talking ready? About Quinty. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, it's just, it just reminded me. It just reminded me of like some other kind of stuff that we were talking. You know how we do. Yep. We just kind of go off on tangents. Everybody's here. Maybe 33 people in there. Okay. This is, this is why the show okay. ends up being three or four hours long. Man, I don't know if I can handle four hours tonight. <laughs> it's fucking hot as hell in here too, man. It, well, it, and also it's, our, it's maybe 78 degrees, but to me, that's fucking hot in Florida indoors and the fucking AC is fucking just jamming, but outside it's got to be over a hundred degrees and it's all fucking humid and there's a damn yeah. storm coming. We had to go out to the liquor store like earlier and it was just like a stupid hot. It is stupid hot yeah. outside. And I don't know. I mean, that hurricane, I think we're only just going to get the edge of it. Right. Last I checked, but I mean, it's still probably going to suck. I don't it's still mind. sunny outside right now, though. I do not mind heat, but I can't stand heat and humidity. And that's all it is here. It's fucking terrible. Yeah, it's just like eternal yeah. swamp ass. Yeah. I don't know why anyone would want to live here. I don't know why we're I living I really here. don't. Okay. I don't. It's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's an accident. And I, well, yeah, well, for it's me, a, for me accident. it was because yeah. I was born here. Right. I was just, I we don't know, you know any better. I don't, you know. Well, I do because I've been other places and I was just like, oh, this is much nicer. I don't have to like yeah. walk around damp all the time. That fucking sucks. So, yeah. So Jack Parsons was a very, he's probably one of the most influential 
I mean, easily one of the most influential rocket scientists, right? I mean, he's one of the founders of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, for yeah. Christ's sake. Um, even though I feel like he's probably not as well known as maybe he should be. Maybe, um, I think what ended up happening, because it was a book that came out about him called Strange Angel. And that came out in, uh, two, I want to say 2014, maybe it was earlier than that. And they started working on a series, like a fictionalized series, like about his life. And it kind of went nowhere, but then CBS All Access got it. So it's, so it went, it ran for two seasons. Like, so they had a show like about yeah. him. So maybe like his, you know, cultural impact has gotten like a lot larger. Right. He's probably one of the most, and, and I think that he's well known too, because of his writings about um, Philema, you know, yeah. Aleister Crowley's thing, and maybe his association with not, not Scientology, but with L. Ron Hubbard, like before L. Ron Hubbard started Scientology yeah. kind of thing, like, because they were all hanging out back then. For all I know, my granddad knew him. Before we get into this, just going to tell the audience, in case you guys don't know, <clears throat> my mother's father, my granddad on my mom's side, was an aerospace aeronautical engineer. He worked for all those damn companies. McDonnell Douglas, Grumman Aerospace, General Atomics. He worked for all of them. He worked on the fucking Saturn project and everything. He uh, fucking, when he was working for Grumman, he uh, also helped help to design the fuel injection system and the fucking turbine system for the fucking engine in the F-14 Tomcat. Got set to Iran to train the Shah's men on how to damn, his Air Force on how to maintain that engine. But he had, my granddad had been through all these fucking aer aerospace and aeronautical companies during that time. He worked he worked on a Saturn project, explosive bolts systems and everything for the fucking Saturn V rocket, the heavy lifting rocket. He worked on fucking shit for fucking General Atomics, fucking that fucking damn atomic fucking rocket that they were making. What was that thing called? Orion. Worked on a lot of fucking shit. A lot of it I don't know about. A lot of it I just heard about it through my uncle. You know what I mean? Because he didn't talk. Um, and it was a different time back then. Those dudes were wild. They were weird. Yeah. And Jack Parsons and probably one of, one of the wildest yeah. of them all. But my, like I said, in a fun yeah. way. My granddad, if he knew this guy, wouldn't have liked him. My granddad, even though he's fucking kind of weird, he, he was a religious fanatic, which which is part of the weirdness. Yeah, you know I mean? that to me is weirder than... Yeah, he was making rockets, but he wouldn't allow fucking television in the house because it was a tool of the devil. Okay, now that's crazy, man. Yeah, You're fucking nuts. I mean... As weird as some of Jack Parsons shit is, because it's like, you know, yes, he was a rocket scientist. Yes, he was a genius um, in making propellants and making the like, you know, a, a lot of the chemical stuff. He was like into that, like developing rocket fuels and stuff. Yeah. Um, it's weird because it seemed like he had this like genius scientific, um, you know, kind of bent. Yeah. But then he also, from a very early age, he wasn't interested in like traditional religion at all. And it doesn't seem like his family was particularly religious. Yeah. But he was always very interested in the occult and in magic. And in, yeah. even when he was a kid, you know, he would say he would try to summon the devil and like all that kind of stuff. So it was like he I think he considered it like two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Like we're going outside of the bounds of human well, understanding like from a scientific standpoint and also from a spiritual standpoint i feel like that's yeah. kind of how he was coming at it well it was a different time back then yeah and that too and another thing is is that it was a scene they were all government contractors and you got your job based on what what project you had already done you know what i mean yeah so you move from one contractor to the to the next you know and it was groups of friends in a big scene shifting around. Through. They all knew each other. All right. And um, it was a different time. No computers. They worked with slide rules. They went to school, all right, like for aeronautical engineering and engineering and chemistry. They went to school for that. Yeah. But you couldn't go to school to learn how to make a damn spacecraft or an atomic bomb. You had to make that shit. Yeah, because no one was right. doing it. No one was doing it. So it was a scene a lot like Hot Rodders. Guys would go and fucking just take an engine and start fucking with it, make a hot rod, you know? Well, they were doing this with the with fucking company money and trying to sell these ideas to the government. They had huge budgets, and uh, they had access to shit other people couldn't have, like nuclear materials that are fucking 
hypergolic fucking rocket fuels. And they had ranges where they could do all this shit. It was, they were like cutting loose a bunch of kids who were real smart and yeah. blowing shit up and making yeah. shit go boom <laughs> and making shit go really fast. <laughs> and they fucking love the shit. And a lot of it was done at the bar. They'd go to the bar and fucking talk about shit, get drunk, fucking write it down on napkins and shit. And, and then burn the napkin when they'd go in the bathroom and set the napkin on fire so nobody else could see the theorems and shit. That's like some secret, some secret shit. shit. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about nuclear propulsion and ex nuclear external combustion engines and shit. And uh, it was a different time. So these were not conventional people. They were fucking wild. Yeah. They were crazy. And I mean, I it's, kind of. Geniuses, but crazy. Yeah, well, those two things often go yeah. hand in hand. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest about it. I, I kind of feel like you have to be kind of crazy yeah. to think that far outside of the box. Yeah. You know what I mean? And if you were to look at my granddad, uh, you know, gra grand Grampy Weems, that's what I call him. And he was Grampy just, Weems. Yeah. And he was just this fucking kind of nerdy. <laughs> Part Syrian looking guy fucking wear the damn white shirt, white short sleeve shirt and a tie. Big old Coke bottle glasses. That's what that's. And they all look like that. I was going to say, they everybody looked, looked like, like that all up until the were, 50s or they, actually until yeah. like the mid 60s. They look right out of something out of one of them damn Saturn V fucking programs at Mission Control. Yeah. You know, right. Mission Control. It's, it's just like is, rows but, yeah. of like yeah, exactly. generic white They're dudes all this, right. with the big glasses yeah. and the shirts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's what they were like. Yeah. And they uh, they drank a bit and they evidently chased women and shit. They were they were toxic, toxically masculine. They were, yeah. They were. That was just the way it was. And they were fucking. Well, they were allowed to get away with it. They were <laughs> well, they could do it. Well, it was just a different time. Yeah, that's and, what I mean. They and were allowed and to do it. The, the expectations were different. Yeah. And uh, they uh, they were under lots of pressure. Uh, but they didn't realize they were under a lot of pressure. They just thought that was normal. They worked, they worked kind of hard, kind of like the Japanese. Yeah. Where they just worked all every day and every fucking night. They were like that. But yeah, I, the thing that I've always found me interested, that I always found interesting about Jack Parsons and like about other people of his ilk, I guess, was that, I mean, these were, he fucking loved rockets man that's like all even for me was a when he was a little kid it's like he would read like all those old sci-fi magazines and stuff we can really do this shit and it's like he would have his little friends over and they would like try to build rockets and like in the backyard and like blow shit up in the backyard and he was just like so into it and so hyper focused on that that you know he did kind of shitty in school and so even though he was a genius because he was just so focused on this one particular goal which, you know, he did actually end up, uh, you know, achieving. So that's something. But yeah, let's. OK, so he's actually uh, his name is not actually Jack Parsons. His birth name. This is fantastic. Is Marvel Whiteside Parsons. Marvel. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, that was his dad's name as well. Yeah. So he was named after his dad. Marvel Whiteside. Marvel Whiteside. So yeah. I guess that's what they called him until like after his parents divorced. Because his parents divorced not too long after he was born. And um, so I guess the mom was kind of over the name. And she's yeah. like, oh, I named my kid after this motherfucker. And now because the dad, much like uh, Jack Parsons would be later on, dad was a little bit of a horn dog. Yeah. Like he got in trouble for banging hookers pretty much. That was uh, all they, the time. They were doing that a lot back then those days, though. Yeah, that but like thing. the wives were still not down with it though. No, because they she down was with it, like, but, but no, bye. They were. <laughs> they would go to casinos and fucking showgirls and fucking ladies of the evening and shit. They had strippers and stuff. You know, they, they had a different way of looking at it. I don't think. The, <laughs> I don't think the dating scene had happened yet because there wasn't a sexual revolution. True. It hadn't happened yet, so there was a lot of damn. Pent up dudes, and then there were fucking women capitalizing off of it. Yeah. You know, selling it. <laughs> but then, you know, the 60s happened, so, you know, it all became for free. <laughs> so, I mean, you had to, but you had to go out there and earn it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You had to talk your way into it. But back then, they just they just paid for it. Yeah, I guess That's that, my understanding. I guess that was. Of the theory. culture of the time. You're dealing with something, a place more like Japan. Yeah. Back then. But yeah, so so Jack Parsons was actually so that's what he ended up like. I, I guess his mom called him John, but uh, all his friends called him Jack. 
So he was actually born in 1914 in Los Angeles. Now, his parents were actually uh, pretty well off. But uh, as I said, his parents divorced like not too long after he was born. Uh, his, uh, his dad like joined the military and like married someone else and they had a kid. And so Jack had a half brother, although he only met him one time. Now, um, they ended up like moving to like his mom and, uh, you know, his, uh, the rest of his family, they ended up moving to this place in California that's called Millionaire's Mile. So they had money, like, so you, you know, they weren't poor. So he had like, when he was growing up, he had servants and all this other kind of shit. Now, like most kids of his predilections, I guess, and you have to think this is very early in the 20th century, you know, 1914 he was born so this is like 1920s when he's kind of a kid um he didn't have a lot of friends he was very uh bookish very solitary um and he was really into reading like he really liked uh king arthur he really liked you know mythology and all that kind of stuff um and then he started reading jules verne and he got really into um sci-fi and rockets and then so he started reading like amazing stories and started thinking that maybe they could really go to the moon one day. They could, you know, build a rocket that could really go to the moon one day. And that kind of became an overarching, you know, belief that he had. And he, that kind of became like his hyper focus. So he starts going to uh, junior high. And as I said, even though he was a genius, I don't think anyone would dispute that. Um, he didn't do very well in school. Now you see this a lot, like particularly with these really, really intelligent kids because they're so hyper-focused on the one thing that they're interested in that they can't be bothered with like other shit. And that seems like what happened to him. Some of his biographers think he might've been dyslexic, but I don't really know. I don't know if there's any way of knowing that, like after all this time. But uh, ironically, it seems very weird because when he was a kid he kind of got bullied a lot because like I said, he was very quiet. He was very solitary. He was into sci-fi, which was very nerdy back then. Um, and he was perceived as effeminate. Um, even though later on he was like very macho, like, or he acted very macho when he grew up. So when he was, when he was a kid though, like he got beat up a lot for being girly or whatever, you know? So he ends up making friends with this other kid named Edward Foreman, who was um, a poor kid. So he was like from the wrong side of the tracks, but he was also really, really into sci-fi, which I imagine a lot of people weren't back then. Like now it's normal, but. I think it was a subculture back it then. It was like, a, and it was probably a very, very small subculture, I would think. And was, like I said, it's it's still considered kind of nerdy nowadays, but back then it was probably like super, super. Well, it was like nerdy. some shit McFly would be into. Right. That Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I'm saying. So I, I kind of yeah. like am feeling that that's, about what's going on now foreman apparently he um was a lot better read than jack parsons was like he had read a lot more sci-fi and a lot more like classic literature and stuff and jack parsons was really into that so they developed a really close friendship and they started a like a little group and they apparently they adapted uh the they adopted the latin motto per aspera ad astra through hardship to the stars that's they started saying that about yeah. themselves and then they started making rockets and making gunpowder and shit like that in their backyards and basically they would either go in the parsons home's backyard or they would go out to um arroyo seco canyon and would basically like blow shit up and they were trying to make like model rockets and they were trying to like make them like go higher and higher and higher and they were doing like different formulations and yeah trying to work out how here's to do a, that. here's the deal Today, we live in a world where rockets are something that go into space or there's weapons, you know, inter intercontinental ballistic missiles. But in the, the days that they're talking about here, rockets were just toys, just kids made them. Yeah, they're, they were not weapons. The, the military really didn't have much interest in them because they were feeble compared to what a cannon could do. So there was no reason to weaponize a rocket. At this era in the 30s after World War One the only people interested in rocketry as a weapon would have been the Germans. Yeah. Because the Germans were limited. They couldn't have artillery. They couldn't have all kinds of shit. 
by by the Treaty of uh, Treaty of Versailles, I think it was called. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They weren't allowed to have any of that, so they were secretly trying to weaponize rockets, and that's why the Germans were so ahead in rocketry, because they were kind of forced to use rockets. Because they didn't have any other avenue. They didn't have any other, uh, other avenue of making any kind of weapons. And rockets were always like second or third best compared to cannons. So a cannon fucking far outstrip a, a rocket of those days. So, but then later on, you know, when people saw what a rocket could do, rockets became top priority. They're like, oh shit, why took, didn't we start yeah, working on those a long time ago? We took all those German rocket scientists, including Werner von Braun. We got, we got them over here in the United States. An operation paperclip and i know some shit about Werner von brown too some one of my dad's friends ended up being kind of a bodyguard to to uh to Werner von brown when he was in the uh, army um because he was living in louisiana a lot of people don't know that but Werner von brown lived in louisiana there was a special rock uh, a special secret rocketry research base in mississippi they had him living in a slidell though but my dad knew the guy and uh, heard some stories about Werner to that guy. Anyway, go ahead. What did Werner get up to? He was an asshole, evidently. Uh, <laughs> he, he, he treated his guards, his, his, he was always under guard because right. they didn't want him running off. Well, yeah. All right. But he treated his guards as his servants. Oh, like they Lord. were his drivers. and one fucking this. Yeah, he was one of those guys. Uh, he saw Americans as like third class citizens. <laughs> um, he had real hot girlfriends. Um, well, you know, no shame in that game. <laughs> yeah, and, and ardent Nazi, ardent Nazi. This whole thing okay, about well, so that's this whole th that's problematic. Th this whole thing about Werner von Braun not really being in with all that Nazi bullshit. Yeah, bullshit. According to people that knew him, no, he was an ardent Nazi. Which is funny because Par I don't know if Jack Parsons ever met him in person, but he did correspond with him. Even though, like I said, Jack Parsons was very, very, yeah. I mean, he was adamantly against the Nazis. He was like more, he was very leftist. He was very yeah. against the Nazis. So uh, so I don't know if they talked about, I think most, mostly they just talked about rocket science. You honestly. see, later on, Werner von Braun was in charge of fucking, you know, he, he was in charge of the American rocketry program. You couldn't tell the American people that he was fucking, he was a Nazi. Okay. Well, yeah, that so, might have been a little upsetting yeah, that, to that people. Have, so what they did was is they kind of like, he had good PR. They were saying, well, he was never really a Nazi. He was never really agreed with any of that stuff. Um, yeah, and he's like, just keep your mouth he's shut. On our, he's on our side type of deal. No, not really. Uh, uh, fucking Ver, Werner von, there is some shit that you could say he was, that he didn't agree with everything that the Nazis were doing. He thought the Nazis were stupid. When it came to how they were using rockets, um, he didn't really agree too much with certain things that Hitler did. He didn't. He didn't think much of Hitler, but he loved Nazism. I guess that's yeah. not good. I just big feel different. Like you know what I mean? He, he liked that party, uh, but you know what I mean. They, he just didn't think it was managed right. That's that's what you know. Well, he was a national socialist. <laughs> that's like fucking hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hilarious! Like you know, you gotta laugh or you're gonna. Well, cry he, or no, he was he was a right? national socialist, and he he you know he believed in all all that stuff. He just didn't think it was run the right way. Well, you put me in charge. Yeah, you know, I will not see the fuck out of this shit. But yeah, it all depends on how you his interpretation <clears throat> of it. You know what I mean? Was not say Hitler's interpretation. Yeah, he he wouldn't have done the things that Hitler did, but he liked the Nazi Party of Delhi even though he disagreed with certain things that it did. Yeah. But mostly we're talking about, I don't think it had much to do with, you know, I don't know what his opinions were on the Jews or anything. You know what I mean? But I think a lot of the disagreement was what, what Germany was doing with the war against Russia and rockets. That's really, I think what he was mostly talking about. Right. But, you know, <laughs> you know. whatever. He, he, <laughs> he was a product of Germany. Very much so. Yeah. So, all right. So, um, so Jack Parsons, like I said, he's kind of like at this point in his life when he's kind of like right before he went to high school, he's been blowing shit up with his friend in the backyard. They've been working on rockets. He also, again, and like I said, from an early age, not only interested in rocket science, but also interested in the occult. Apparently when he was a kid, he 
uh, kind of performed a ritual where he was trying to summon the devil. Oh, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> yeah, somebody said Iron Sky. I still need to like, we still yeah. need to review that fucking shit. Um, but yeah, so he apparently did this ritual to summon the devil. And I guess he thought that it worked or he later claimed that he thought that it worked and it like freaked him out. And so he decided he wasn't going to do it anymore. So I, like I said, it's very strange. And I think that people, um, you know, think that it's one or the other, like people that are really scientific minded, whatever, don't believe in like occult kind of shit, but that's not necessarily the case. Like people are a lot more complex yeah. than they seem to be. Yeah. My granddad would be a good example. Fucking, you know, he was involved in all that same shit, but he was big into the fucking Bible. He could sit and I, and he evidently did not stumble upon Christ myth, myth theory. So how smart could he have been? Well, I, I, don't, I don't really feel like that was because when I started reading about mythicism, like in maybe the late 90s, yeah. it was very fringe. I think yeah. I got like a couple books from like American Atheist or something because I because I was in that. And they had like a couple of like, you know, very, very small press books about that. So it yeah. was like seemed like it was a very fringe idea. Yeah. Even up until the 2000s. Yeah. You know, well, I know one thing, man. He could do fucking advanced mathematics in his head and use things on fucking and, and, and just use a slide rule. Yeah, they were smart. They were real good with numbers. Yeah. And they could just write, jot things down on paper and say, yeah, that'd work. You know, they're, that's the kind of guys they were. Yeah. And I they mean, would build something and then break it and figure out how to make it so it wouldn't break. Yeah. They did that a lot. I mean, it's hard in some ways. It's like, it's hard for me to understand because I'm always, you know, I've always been interested in science and I'm, you know, I'm very, you know, like we've said on the show before, I'm very Spock like in the way that I'm very into yeah. like science and logic and stuff. So it's hard for me to square being really into science and having a scientific mindset. And then also having belief in the occult or belief in like fundamentalist religions or something like that. That's very weird to me. I don't like my brain wouldn't, doesn't work that way. I mean, but upbringing. I, but I, yeah, I can understand like how other people might have that, but it's just like, I can't relate to it directly using, because were, my brain doesn't work like they that. They were using all their brain power to solve certain specific tasks. All right. Now I do know that a lot of the engineering that they were doing, it was backed up with mathematics, but a lot of it was imagineering too. Yeah. The, 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 the human mind, its creative functions are very good, almost like a supercomputer somehow in a certain way. They could just draw something and go, that'll fly. You know what I mean? By just yeah. drawing it, go, that'll fly. <laughs> or they'll just draw a fucking combustion chamber and go, okay, ignition should happen right here. Well, if you understand chamber. the principles. They understand the principles, right. You know, it, in a really like fundamental way. Yeah, but they were doing things inside combustion chambers, putting little veins and things to make eddies to get more complete combustion. But they were doing it just by instinct and imagination. Yeah. You could go back and check it with a computer and go, yeah, that's real fucking close to what the computer would say. Yeah. So they were just doing it by imagining it of what is happening in there. So the human mind's pretty fucking badass when you think about it. It is. As long as you understand it what it is you're doing, you can imagine how it should be and, I mean, and come yeah, real close. I mean, when you think about human brains, yes, they're very clutched together. Yes, they're very messy. Yes, they have mm -hmm. like a lot of blind spots and, you know, various things that go wrong. But when you really step back and think about it, I mean, the human brain is really pretty Doing, amazing it's doing a lot of stuff a computer can't do and least, it's yeah. doing a bunch of stuff that you're not aware of yeah. in fact like probably 95 percent of the shit that it's doing is just shit that's going on like in the like, just background noise yeah. which is like mind-blowing to me i mean because look i was reading a book not too long ago about all the shit that your brain does that you're not like conscious of and they're like do you realize like how much trouble it is for your brain to like actually have you walk. They're yeah. like, it's really, really difficult because, and the reason that they know it's difficult now is because they've tried to build robots like that can walk like a human. And yeah. it's really hard Yeah, because it's like, but your brain does it and you're not even aware of it. Yeah. Well, it's all that evolution. Right. 
yeah, we've had millions of years yeah. of trying to get our shit together. Trial and error and everything. And I mean, and like I like said, the human body is not perfect, obviously. Um, you know, people get back aches, people get, you know, childbirth is painful. And there's that's evolution too. But evolution is not survival of the fittest, it's survival of the fit enough. It's yeah. like it was good enough to not kill you. So it's fine. well, you only have to be good enough to reproduce once. Exactly. That's all. Exactly. So it doesn't have to be optimal. No, it just has to be good enough. The whole idea is, can you live long enough and be pretty enough to your mate to reproduce at least once? Yeah, that's all it takes. That's all that matters. That's all really. that matters. That's all that matters. Being a pretty motherfucker is part of it. <laughs> all these creatures are pretty to some, to, to another creature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> even a blobfish even a blobfish is somehow pretty to another is sexy to another blobfish yeah, that's all right which that makes me feel better about myself <laughs> i mean yeah. if you ever feel ugly just think to yourself even blobfish are having sex out there and yeah. if you've never seen a blobfish google that shit yeah you'll feel a lot better <laughs> but yes <laughs> i pick on the blobfish they're cute they're it, you know in an ugly way but so <laughs> so jack parsons he starts going, he goes to high school and he did like fencing and shit like that. But he did kind of terrible in high school because, like I said, he was obsessed with rockets and he didn't really give a shit about any of the other, you know, subjects. So his mom pulls him out of high school and puts him in a military academy, like a private boarding school in San Diego. He's not there very long before he blows up the toilets because, you know, that's just what he did. He blew shit up. That's an old trick, though. Everybody was trying to blow up the toilets. Even well, he did it. School. Yeah. He did it. They were doing that when I was in high school. So Dropping they... M80s in the toilets. Well, yeah. That's just an old Now, one. see, I don't know if he just used something as pedestrian as an M80 or if yeah. he, like, invented some special shit. And you don't throw the M80 in the toilet. That's a fucking... that that That's that... Because it'll just Just a go pro out. tip for anyone that just wants to blow up the do. toilets at their you school. Put it underneath the toilet seat. <laughs> and light it. I saw it done. <laughs> Blows you want seat. maximum explosion. Yeah, you put it on the toilet seat. <laughs> <laughs> this is such this show is just a wealth of information. Yeah. yeah. And for going to prison. <laughs> I saw it. I saw it happen. In case you're interested in like ever wanting to have a life of crime. I saw it in the third grade. <laughs> you can tune in and get some tips. <laughs> I, I saw it in the third grade, a fifth grader. Ah. A fifth grader put an M M80 underneath the fucking toilet seat. That was back before they even had doors on the stalls back in fucking bath in, in, in middle school. And I was standing there and fucking looking at it. And then boom! And it, it shocked me. Blew that fucking seat up. Huh. Yeah. Now, did it blow the whole toilet like no. apart? No. No. Blew the seat up. Fucking smoke and shit. Big old no. flash. It's kind of anticlimactic. Yeah. But they were trying to crack it. Yeah, like explode the explode the toilet. I yeah, mean, no. I would assume. I don't know. I wasn't there, yeah. but I would assume that Jack Parsons knew enough about rocket accelerants yeah, and explosives make to make a really good one. Yeah. So I would think that he blew that toilet up real good. Mm -hmm. I mean, he did get expelled. So, <laughs> so they moved to Pasadena at this point. Um, the Great Depression starts to happen because at this point we're in 1930 thereabouts. Um, and some of their fortune starts to dwindle away. Now they send Jack to like a more liberal, like private school. And he does a lot better there. Like, cause they weren't, um, Jack Parson seems like one of those people that he's just very, very anti-authoritarian. You know what I mean? That's seemed like, uh, you know, something that was, uh, a hallmark of his personality, like through his whole life. So when he was sent to a school where, it was less about like, you know, just being told what to do or rote memorization or something like that. He did a lot better when he was just kind of allowed to like left to his own devices or when the teaching methods were different. So uh, he actually ended up editing the school newspaper and, you know, he won all kind of awards like for literary things and whatnot. Now he actually um, wanted to study chemistry. Now he started, he wanted to go to Caltech um, but at this point, like I said, his family's, it was the depression. So his family's fortune was kind of like being, was ebbing away. Um, so they couldn't really afford to send him there. What he started doing was that when he wasn't, and he's still in school at this point, is like on weekends and evenings and stuff, he starts working at this place called the Hercules Powder Company. 
And um, so he starts like learning how to mix explosives and, you know, and learning more about rocket propulsion and things like that. Cause that's what this company did. So he kind of got some on the job training when he was still kind of a teenager. Now he also was still hanging out with, uh, with his friend Edward Foreman and they were still like building rockets and doing shit like that. He would sometimes like steal some of the shit from his job so they could come home and build like better, like rocket fuel and shit like that. So they could blow shit up. Now, even when, when he was still a teenager, like I said, he's still like high school age at this point, he had built a solid fuel rocket engine so he kind of like starts talking and, and at this point i guess like what this small scene or whatever was kind of getting around so at this point he starts corresponding with some other like dudes like Werner von braun and like other people who were kind of in the vanguard of like the you know the rocket engineers at that point so he graduates in 1933 they move to a smaller house him and his mom and his grandmother now, he enrolled at a junior college. He wanted to get a degree in uh, physics and chemistry, but they didn't really have enough money to pay his tuition, so he had to drop out. And he started working full-time at the Hercules Powder Company. Now, they sent him to Hercules, California. Um, and so, it was, you know, the, their, uh, you know, company there. And he started making... His monthly wages at that place were $100 a month, which in 1933 was That's like a bad. lot of money. Yeah. That was like, I think it was like $1,200, $1,300 a month, yeah. which was actually really good for the time. Um, he actually started suffering from headaches because he was constantly exposed to nitroglycerin, which I guess that's one of the side effects of that. Now he started like socking money away because he wanted to go to Stanford and get a degree in chemistry but the tuition was ultimately too much for him even back then. So he couldn't afford it. So he went back to Pasadena. So he actually never, he did get some formal education and on the job education, but he never did get a full degree in any of the shit that he was studying. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he's kind of self-taught in a way. Yeah. That wouldn't hold you back back then on that. Scene. No, it didn't. It, it, it didn't. Cause like I said, you couldn't go to school for half the shit they were doing anyway. Yeah. As long as you could do the work, could talk the talk and get shit done, you could get a you could get a job contracted at any of those fucking government contractors as long as you could deliver. And that's and pretty much it, yeah, that's pretty it. much what happened to yeah. him. It was all experimental shit. Yeah. Like I said, they were like hot rodders. Yeah. That's all they were. You know, I don't know if you I don't know if that translates too well to people outside the United States, but a hot rodder is just a guy who fucking makes shit for his car. Yeah. Or his rifle. You know, they got guys hot rodding the R fifteen now. You know, uh a lot of guys can come up with some crazy shit just by imagineering. Yeah. If you're real interested in it, a hobby is the most intense form of study. A guy who's really into the shit, he doesn't really have to go to school for it. He's going to teach it himself. Yeah. You I know? mean, if you're interested enough in yeah. something, you're going to learn everything you need to learn. Yeah. Then you can just do it on your own. You don't yeah. need somebody like no. telling you. You can walk in and go, I can fix this. I can do this. And you can sit there and just run it with another trained engineer. And he goes, Oh, yeah. He knows what he's talking about. Right. You know? Yeah. So there was a lot of that. Yeah. It was not a fucking stuff shirt corporate scene. These were wild men, especially Lockheed Martin. Yeah. Down there, what you'd call Area 51. That was a fucking, it didn't exist in this, in the era you're talking about here. But yeah. later on, Area 51 was nothing but just, it wasn't, it was called Groom Lake. That's what it was really called. Yeah. Down there, it was nothing but just wild asses, gangsters, and fucking convicts because- all the fucking staff who cleaned the buildings and mowed the yards and did all the fucking normal maintenance, they were all convicts and illiterate guys. Because a convict would, an ex con wouldn't be believed. Yeah. So he could run his <laughs> mouth and nobody believe him. Right. And they paid him in cash. And then illiterate people couldn't read anything, so they couldn't spy. You know? And then it was all these fucking crazy mad scientists making spy planes. <laughs> this is documented. Yeah. But what was funny is that all these fucking convict dudes can't prove that they ever worked there. They were only paid in cash. Well, that's the way they wanted yeah. it. That's why they had it set yeah. up like that. They recognized one dude who was living out in a trailer. This is back in the uh, 2000s, early 2000s. 
they gave him a retirement check and admitted that, yeah, he, he worked there for like 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> but they paid him in like a weird circuitous, circuitous route yeah. to give him a retirement check. That's pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> they had a thing on TV about it. But he was there during the A-bomb tests and everything. So, all right. So he wants, so Jack Parsons wanted to get in with uh, the dudes from like Caltech and stuff like that. Like I said, he didn't have all the credentials or whatnot. So he gets introduced to a guy called Frank Molina, who was a graduate student at Caltech and him and Ed Foreman, his friend and um, Jack, they kind of get together and they formed this sort of like little I guess you call it like a little club, like a little loose club or something like that. Now, the funny thing is it's called the Suicide Squad, which is probably yeah. where the fucking DC got the name from or whoever wrote the, you know, comic book. Um, they're called the Suicide Squad, obviously, because they were always blowing shit up and could have been killed at any point in time. So, as I said, when this was going on, I mean, rocketry was still very much seen as a science fiction yeah. type of thing. Like no one was really taking it all that seriously. Yeah. And I got to remember, I want, I don't want to for, I want to foreshadow this before you guys lose track of this shit. This sounds like a science program, but we're talking about a motherfucker that eventually tries to bring about the antichrist. This is how <laughs> weird this shit is. It tries to bring about the advent of the antichrist. We're going to get to that in a minute. I don't even know if it was the Antichrist. Kind of like the Moon Child, I think is what it was called. Right? Yeah, which yeah. wasn't, I mean, he was trying to bring about like yeah. a scarlet <laughs> woman or like the yeah. ideal woman, like a goddess. Yeah. And then they were going to have like a spiritual child, not a real baby, but a spiritual baby. They were going like, to try to make that. Child they were going to try to bring it. That was going to go to the moon. Or they, were trying to make, they were trying to make that thing from Forbidden Planet. Yeah, that invisible I, I fucking, feel like. Remember the, <laughs> remember the invisible fucking thought monster. Yeah, I kind of yeah, feel yeah. like that's what they were doing. It's like I mean, that. Thank you, thank you, Bunny Hunter. Let me see some flashball. Good this morning, is, guys. Just woke up. Oh my goodness. This, what time is it in Australia? Yeah. Oh my god, I don't even know. This is the beginning of the month. It is flashbulb day. <laughs> it is. It's August first today. Isn't yes, it? It is. Yeah, it is. It is the beginning of the month. I totally forgot. Yeah. So, so all these guys that formed the Suicide Squad, they very quickly come to the realization that Jack Parsons, um, that his kind of contribution to the world, that he's, the thing that he was best at was making rocket fuels. And like yeah. I said, not all, he was like a chemical genius. He was kind of like the dude that was into that. So... Um, because what you wanted was you wanted something that was like powerful enough to be able to, you know, propel a rocket out of the atmosphere, but it had to be controllable. So you didn't just blow everything up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Which is a very hard uh, yeah. balance to, to achieve. So. <clears throat> they eventually, the Germans eventually figured it out, but that shit was so fucking dangerous and so bad. It was fucking pure hydrogen peroxide, and I think the other one was like pure chlorine. I think it was chlorine. Somebody yeah. Might, somebody might correct me. You mix those two together, they fucking immediate, immediately explode. It's hypergolic. There's no reason to... You don't even need to ignite them with anything. They, they self-ignite. That, that shit there was bad, but it ate through all the damn gas tanks. It ate through all the gas lines, and it was difficult to handle. But as far as power to weight ratio, that's the one. That's the one to use. They were using it in the damn rocket planes. Yeah. Yeah. But Parsons wouldn't have known about that. The shit was too fucking volatile. And it was hard to make. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he would have had the facilities. He had to wear rubber suits. It was fucking extremely toxic. Yeah. I was, <laughs> sorry. I was, I was laughing at some of the... Uh, Tammy just showed up and said, did yeah. I miss anything good? Yeah, you missed, and then she goes, you missed everything good. Yeah. Just blobfish and exploding toilets. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. That was <laughs> blobfish and exploding toilets. That's what I should name. Are this we still show. in the first hour? Uh we're just in an hour. Okay. He says in Australia, it's almost eight in the morning. It's like Damn. eight in the morning. 
Is that That's on the other side of the damn planet. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Wait, is it eight Saturday morning or eight Sunday morning? Probably Sunday. Are they behind or in know. front of? I, I can't remember. I don't know. I don't know. I know. Well, I know because I used to live in the UK that there's a five hour difference, but I think it was like five hours later, but I don't really know. Cause it's on like the opposite side of the world. So I'm just really confused right now, but yeah. So, <laughs> so the uh, actual versions of the fuel mixtures that Jack Parsons ended up coming up with would like later be used by NASA. Yeah. So at the start of the 1940s, um, Molina, he goes to the national Academy of sciences and he asked them for funding and he said he wanted to study what they, and they called it jet propulsion because nobody wanted to call anything rocket anything because it had that stigma of like, Ooh, sci-fi. You well, know what I mean? Yeah. So they had to call every, anything, everything jet propulsion because it sounded like more sciencey. Well, jet propulsion also meant rocket was any, anything other than propellers. It was, That's but they the, just didn't want to call it yeah, they didn't want, right. rocketry, rocketry or rocket or, science or right. anything. They didn't want to call it anything like that because the na the word rocket had like a sci-fi stigma to it. A rocket is a jet. Uh -huh. And a jet is a rocket in a way. Yeah. You know, it's just semantics. Yeah. I mean, if you put a, you take a jet engine, what we would call a jet engine, and then you just dump fuel in the fucking... In, in the exhaust stream in the back of it, it's called an afterburner. It thrusts just like a rocket. That's what an afterburner is. It's like a rocket. Yeah. The, the turbine blades are almost kind of like a, just a compressor. It's just a different interpretation of jet. Jets and rockets are two different interpretations of each other. You understand what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think there's a big difference, but not really. Well, no. Not really. About the same. For a long time, they weren't sure whether or not fighter planes were going to be jet or rocket. And in a, in a turbo, in a, in a fucking after burning jet has a lot of, at, has a lot of attributes of a rocket, but only when the afterburner's on. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> one thing or the other. It's all. Yeah. So they're coming up with all this stuff in the group. Um, they also, I mean, they had like, they shared a lot of kind of uh, political views um, they smoked weed. Uh, yeah. They were really into drinking. They were kind of party dudes, you know. Yeah, yeah they were all like that. <laughs> so Jack Parsons and Molina, actually, I read, uh, they wrote a uh, science fiction screenplay that was like semi-autobiographical. And they were trying to like pitch it to like Hollywood execs, even though it was like a pacifist type of movie. Yeah. So that didn't go anywhere. So Jack Parsons ends up meeting... The woman that would be his first wife in 1934. Now he met her at a church dance of all places. So they get married in 1935. Now he ends up getting a job at a place called Halifax powder company. Um, and even though like Jack Parsons was making quite a bit of money at the time, but he would use pretty much all of his money to fund this new rocket research group that they had started so to make extra money, he apparently was uh, making nitroglycerin in their house. Um, he had like a lab, like in their porch on their, or their garage or something. And uh, also at one point, he pawned Helen's engagement ring, hmm. which she was not super happy Damn. about. Surprising. He got it back though, right? Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, he got it back. I don't know if he ever got it he back. He just put it in hock to get some fucking cash. <laughs> to get some cash. Get a loan against it. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, so, um, so they made some rockets uh, and they, you know, over this time period and they were like launching them, but a lot of them failed and like blew up or whatever, um, you know, set fire, uh, you know, cause it was just too combustible or whatever. Now they, uh, they get another, uh, a mathematician from Caltech. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm like, cause I'm assuming this name, it sounds, it's like a Chinese name. Uh, Cheyenne Susan, and he actually joined the group in 1937. So this is kind of, so like I said, this is their little suicide squad group. It's very, it's not like official official. Like there's, there was no such thing as NASA at this point. This is just like a bunch of guys who were kind of funded by the national Academy of sciences who were kind of working on quote unquote jet propulsion and were kind of getting funding where they could get it. You know what I mean? 
Um, another thing that happened around this time period um, that kind of pushed Jack Parsons into the spotlight a little bit and made him like legitimized him, I guess, as like an expert in, you know, rocket fuel and in various like explosive devices was he actually acted as a witness in a trial of this guy named Captain Earl Kynet. He was like the head of police intelligence in LA. And he was accused of a conspiracy of setting a car bomb in uh, an attempted murder case. Like with this private investigator named Harry Raymond, who was former LAPD, his car had blown up. I don't know if he was killed in it or not. I guess not because it was attempted murder. But um, so this guy who was like the head of the police was accused. And Jack Parsons actually gave testimony at that trial, like about the explosive and how the car bomb was probably made. And his testimony, they think, like, helped to convict that guy. So after that happened, it was kind of a very public trial. So after that happened, like, Jack Parsons got um, kind of a reputation as being, like, the go-to guy, like, expert on explosives and stuff. So he was, like, the guy they would go to whenever they needed somebody that, to talk about explosives. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's just internal combustion and, and external combustion are all the same thing. He'd be the man to know if he's making rocket fuel, it's a type of explosive. Yeah, you would think that. Right. So at this point, um, you know, there's other kind of shit going on. He's doing the rocket stuff. He's also like a little bit in some political groups. I think he kind of flirted with Marxism, communism, stuff like that, even though he was never really da completely down with communism. Um, but he did go to some of the meetings and stuff, which would get him in trouble later on. Uh, a lot he, of people don't realize how far back that goes in American history. He was in the ACLU. Yeah. He was in like other things like that. Yeah. Um, but he didn't want to join the American Communist Party, which was very small at the time, um, even though he was interested and went to some of the meetings, but he wasn't all the way down with that. So he um, ends up getting into the occult probably through like some friends of theirs. So in 1939, there's this other couple that him and his wife, Helen, know. they're called John and Francis Baxter. And they take Jack and Helen to the Thelema church or the church of Thelema yeah. in uh, Hollywood. Yeah. So you guys know who that is. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> oh, what's his name? Alistair, Alistair Crowley. Crowley. Yeah. yeah. So they go to this uh, thing and he saw um, they did like a Gnostic mass. And there were other like kind of famous people there at the time, like John Carradine was into it. And like there was um, Harry Hay, who was like a gay rights activist at the time in 1939. Um, so Jack Parsons got very, very interested in this belief system, in this occult belief system of Thelema. So he had already kind of knew a little bit about Thelema, about the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, which we talked about when we talked about the, uh, the Aleister Crowley show. And he had read some Crowley um, in the past. So he kind of got into it. So he, um, he kind of like got, he met like a lot of the members of the church and got friendly with them and starts going back to their events and starts reading more books by Aleister Crowley and he starts trying to get his wife into it, like trying to get her to read them. And he started to think that maybe there was something to this whole Thelema magic thing. Mainly, he kind of thought of it the same way that we kind of talk about poltergeist activity. In the sense that he thought that quantum physics would eventually explain. Yeah. What he's basically getting at is that it's kind of like what in modern day you would think of as, you know, remember that book that came out, The Secret, that's kind of yeah. like the law of attraction. Like if you put something out in the universe, like the universe will provide for you. It's kind of something like that. If you put the energy or the intent that you put out in the universe, if you put it out in the right way, it should come back to you if you do it in the right way. Um, a lot of the shit they were doing was sex magic, obviously, because there was a, there was kind of an understanding that because sex or having orgasms was such a powerful human thing that while you were in the midst of that, that it would make your intent or your, 
you know, the magic or the, you know, the intent that you were sending out into the universe, it would make it that much more powerful. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Plus it was a good way of getting laid. Well, exactly. And, yeah. and, and you know, that that's was, what I think it was that really was a happy. Yeah, yeah. I think that's kind of what I it was about too. Really I mean, and I'm not saying it's like, you know, people have believed all kinds of things. Um, so I'm not saying that he didn't actually, because he really did seem to actually believe in these things, maybe more than some of the other people that were there. Well, but I can kind of understand it, you know, with my with my own personal experience of poltergeist activity, how based on what I saw, emotion can somehow alter the, your consciousness into a point to where you start doing where, where weird things start happening in the environment. RSPK. Yeah. Okay. So maybe they're saying the emotions from sex can do it. That's kind of what they were getting at, yeah. But in my experience, no, I think it's the dark, more of the darker emotions. Fear. Anger. Fear, anger, frustration. Yeah. That, that does it, that, you know, in my opinion. But like you said, you know, this, this belief system at least has the, you know, happy side effect of getting laid, get laid. and free love right. and all that. And you might, if you got a good cult, you're going to attract hotties. <laughs> you, might get, you might get male anermy. <laughs> in, in, in your cult, you know what I mean? That's vampire if you vampire, guys didn't yeah. know. <laughs> she was hot, man. She was looking real hot. Man, like with earliest goth. Yeah, with Chelsea haircut and everything. She did. Super hot. I could not believe that when I saw that fucking picture. Some reason, for some reason, um, holy well, crap. Yeah, James Dean didn't like her, evidently. He dated her and he was like, I gotta get rid of her. She must have been fucking crazy. Either that or maybe James Dean was just a dick. I mean... That could be true. Well, yeah, but, well both know, of those I, things could I think, be true. Yeah, too. I think. Well, I think they were both pretty difficult to be around. If you ask me. Yeah, uh, and when you, you get two people that are difficult to be around, maybe they can't be around each other because they're just both too difficult. He could drive a car, though. Evidently, he couldn't dodge that damn truck. But it, actually, people people said that he really didn't have much choice. I mean, the headlights of the era wasn't, weren't very good, and he did try to swerve instead of brake. Shit, man! They didn't even have the headlights seat weren't belts. that good back then. They didn't then, even yeah. have seat belts until I think when? his car had the seat 70s? belts. Though. I think that Porsche Spider might have had racing seat belts in it, though. I think Oracle says, "Funny how beautiful women are always essential to sex magic, but the men don't have to be handsome." Well, mm. exactly, and that's true of porn. That's kind yeah. of true of anything. They just have to have the money to afford the situation. Yeah. Back in the day, you can look like Ron Jeremy yeah. and still be in porn. But Ron Jeremy was good looking when he was young. He was a Playgirl centerfold. I mean, he used to be in shape. I don't know. It's I, I just yeah, feel like even back then. Well, you, he's known for the he, for for the hedgehog period. <laughs> the you hedgehog know? period. Yeah, he's a little <laughs> fucking tubby and hairy and shit. But in the seventies, I saw pictures. I'm of not him in the judging. 70s. I'm sure some people are looked, into that look. He was, you know, in the seventies. He was what was popular in the seventies. He had the handlebar mustache and the, you know, like this. And he he, he kind of was like a. Uh, Oh shit! What was that? Like a Burt Reynolds, yeah, looking type guy. Which I was never into that either. That was a popular look. Though. I know it was. I right. know. I just yeah. I didn't get it. Even in the seventies, I didn't get. I mean, I was a kid in the seventies, but I didn't get it. <clears throat> <laughs> I don't know. It I don't. I don't fucking... like facial hair. Well, it's a, I guess because my dad had a beard and mustache, so it's just like that'd be like lusting after your dad, and that's weird. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you're looking at it from from your point of view. The, well, uh, you know, duh. fucking guys, don't, <laughs> guys aren't looking at it from that point of view. I'm just saying that that what what was popular at, at that t particular time was kind of a dude with a mustache, and he had a yeah. cowboy hat like the Marlboro Man. Yeah, I remember. But he was like a cool dude, and he had a fucking Trans Am. Yeah, like, Trans Am. Yeah, sure. Trans Am, and he fucking walked around and and said funny shit, but would you know what I mean? And try to act like a badass. But what was funny is that. For the era, I guess people didn't really recognize, didn't notice it at the time. Those dudes had no physical fitness. Well, you know nobody I mean? was, did. It nobody wasn't did, really yeah. a thing. Yeah. It, I mean, like really fit dudes, like yeah. weightlifting and stuff like because we that did was, the show about that. Yeah, that, that was, that like was not cool back then. Well, it was not. like a very, very yeah. small like and it subculture. Was a, and it was a gay thing, really. I think it was. It was more of a gay thing. Yeah. Right? I mean, not entirely, but that was like I a mean, large part of it. In the 70s, the action heroes of the 70s, very few of them worked out. All right. And thank they, you, Bunyan. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me see some down flash bulbs. <laughs> and then when they did work out, they hid the fact that they worked out because that was cheating. 
You were just supposed to be a badass and big and strong by your own. In you were just supposed manliness. to lay around, you were just supposed to lay around and, and be eat a bad, big yeah. fucking American get, hamburgers and get strong as fuck just sitting and there. Belt back some fucking yeah. Budweiser, and that explains the hat still be in shape. That explains Charlton Heston because he, the Hest would walk around like he was a fucking. 20 feet tall and just this badass and he'd take his shirt off like he was a badass but you're looking at him and you go dude put your shirt back on man. <laughs> put the fucking shirt back on man well in a lot of ways it was like much easier back yeah. then like especially for dudes because it's like you could basically yeah. look like anything like yeah. nowadays both women and men, you have to fucking, you if you're going to be in game. the movies, you gotta, be on your game. you gotta have personal trainers. Yeah. You gotta have nutritionists and chefs. Anabolic and she- steroids. You gotta have all, yeah, yeah. And you gotta like do all this stuff. Cause you have to look per- yeah. And even then it's not good enough. Cause they still got to CGI your ass. They'll yeah. CGI some ads on there yeah. and shit. It's like, so you're still, you do all that yeah. and you're still not good. enough. And I hate to hate to fucking, you know, shatter your image of these fucking celebrities and these fucking Marvel s- these guys in these Marvel movies, that's anabolic steroids. Well, yeah, I, I don't think anyone's like upset about that. Yeah, that's I mean, anabolic I think steroids. Everybody a lot of people don't believe that. But and like I said, yeah, some of it's like, CGI too. Some, yeah. Like after like it's post-production. Although, Daniel Craig, I'm now convinced that was not anabolic steroids. I, uh, well, he's not a huge dude. He's, not he's that just big. in good shape. He's just in good shape. And he was always in pretty much good shape. Yeah. And for James Bond, he... Put on a couple of pounds of muscle, but that'd be easy to do without anabolics. It just and for the character, I mean, he's not like he's fucking not. Arnold and Predator. He's James You're Bond. Right. He's supposed to mostly be like shooting and we're sidetracking. And I know these motherfuckers love it when we sidetrack. I just got done watching Predator again. Arnold is not as stupid big as people think he is in that movie. He was a lot smaller than he was in his well, yeah, in, but in, you know, say like in the Conan era in his body in his weightlifting era. He's lost a lot of weight. Yeah. Uh, he had good sized guns and a nice chest and shit, but he's nowhere near as big as he was in Conan. Yeah. He's just, none of those guys actually are people. People are imagining them being bigger than what they really are. You were, if you were to put those guys up against bodybuilders of today, those guys look small. Yeah. But like bodybuilders, the bodybuilders today of today like- are fucking freakish they're monstrous freakishly monstrous. although i do feel like and we talked about this a little bit on the weightlifting show was that i feel like there was a, there was a peak where it's like it was just yeah. peak monster where it's just like you had to just get it big as possible even yeah. if it looked terrible but i feel like it's going a little bit more toward like not so yeah. freakish looking nowadays like a little more natural a lot of people don't realize that back in the 70s if you talk about just physique one of the guys with the best physiques you never would notice it until you see him walking around without his shirt off, it was Charles Bronson. Yeah. Charles Bronson fucking worked out. He worked out. He, he, he looked really good. He had a hot wife, too. And, um, but you don't, they don't really showcase him in his movies. Yeah. You know, he but, was a different type of character. He yeah, played different types of characters. He was a short guy, but he was, uh, he worked out. <coughs> he, looked, he looked really good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you were to make him bigger and put him side by side with Arnold and Predator, not that different. About like that. Yeah. But you just can't really tell in the movies that he was in. Well, like I said, that wasn't really yeah. like a lot of the characters he was playing. Mm-hmm. So, all right. So, like I said, Jack Parsons been going to this the Lima church, getting into all this type of, getting interested in all this sex magic type of stuff. Now, around this time, um, he starts... Uh, kind of lusting after his wife's younger sister, Sarah, otherwise known as Betty. Now, at the time they met, I believe she was only 17 years old. So that's a little weird. I mean, you know what I mean? It's like she's not super young, but still. And also that's your wife's sister. So again, a little weird. Now, I I feel like Jack Parsons' wife she kind of went along with the Thelema thing for a little while. Like they get initiated into this one lodge uh, in the early 1940s, like 1941. Um, You know, they're all up with Aleister Crowley. They meet him They're You know, they're very like high up in the shit. So, but as time went on, as they got more into, I mean, it got to a point too, where they were talking about Jack Parsons being like Alistair Crowley's like successor, like at this particular 
lodge or this particular. So, you know what I mean? He was kind of like high up in the rankings, but it did get to a point where his wife was just kind of like when they get into the sex magic and all the orgies and everything like that, she's like, yeah, I just don't know if this is really what I'm, what I want to do. You know what I mean? So at this point, it seems like he kind of went back and went after his wife's, younger sister i'm gonna make another drink yeah like i said she was whoops well that was my that was my little thing right there so yeah so there was that whole kind of thing going on now another thing that happened too and this kind of started to occur in the 1930s maybe even earlier was that because of jack's interest in the occult and his relationship with Aleister Crowley and his involvement with all of these quote unquote satanic groups, or that's at least how they were perceived. Also, he had very leftist political beliefs. He had flirted, like I said, with Marxism. He wasn't a communist, but he had gone to like some of the communist means. He was interested in that type of thing. And so he kind of got onto the FBI's radar and they kind of started watching him. I don't know how early they started watching him. Um, and he kind of like said later on that he thought they were watching him for like a really long time before then. And I don't really have any reason to doubt that because it did come out later that they had been watching him. So I'm not sure when they started. It was probably sometime in the forties, but um. I, it kind of ramped up later on because they accused him of uh, spying, which I don't think he really was. They did like a couple of independent like investigations of it. And it didn't seem like he was doing anything. He just did like one thing and it wasn't, you know, it, it was just like him being dumb or like not thinking about the optics of it. I don't think he was like spying for anyone, but the FBI kind of perceived it that way. So he was kind of under surveillance uh, for a time. So, uh, like I said, they get into, Ooh, thank you very much. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, that's so nice of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bonnie. But it's like, it's really nice that you guys come by and hang out with us on Saturday nights and whenever else we record, I'm just like going, I don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. I've only had one drink, but yeah. So, like I said, I was talking earlier about, uh, Crowley and about their whole, you know, do what thou wilt type of thing. So they were very individualistic, not so much satanic, but they really did kind of feel like what, you know, that people couldn't really like tell you what to do. And, and I should say that Jack Parsons was actually, again, very ahead of his time in the sense that he was very egalitarian. He was very, uh, for women's rights, for women's equality. He was very into um, the government not policing sexual morality. Um, so he did hang out with a lot of, uh, you know, kind of progressives, liberals, stuff like that at that time, who were kind of trying to, you know, get the government out of like people's sex lives or, you know, keep like the morality police type of thing. So he was like, up in that. And he really did seem to believe in those uh, ideals of having men and women be equal, having, you know, having, you know, not, not being laws against homosexuality or against like adultery or against things like that. So he was very much ahead of his time in that uh, way and hung out with the, that scene of people, um, you know, and even later on in the fifties, like with the beats and everything like that, his writings became, were very popular with them. So, <clears throat> so he basically he's made like quite a bit of money from working on uh you know all these rockets and fuels and uh you know working for these companies he's been working for and he actually ended up um earning enough money to buy a mansion in pasadena which he ended up calling the parsonage because <laughs> his last name was Parsons. So yeah, so he calls it the Parsonage, because of course he did. And uh, so this um, mansion ends up becoming kind of like 
the party house, man. That's like everybody was going there for the orgies and the drugs. You I'm missed these. I'm missing big old flash bulbs. You missed all the orgies and the drugs. Yes, oh, Bunyip yeah, sent us twenty dollars. Oh my god, time. that's awesome. I know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so they're having all these. Uh, he's there with his uh, 17-year-old sister-in-law engaging in some quote-unquote sex magic. Uh, you know, everyone's got drugs. Um, everyone's That's having that. orgies. Everyone's just having a good old time. Thank you very much, Matt. I just, you saw it before I did. I have yeah. a lag on a mine. Lag, so, yeah. yeah. Um, some people have to, some people that actually went to some of these parties that he had at the parsonage described it as looking like a Fellini movie, which like I said, sounds like a good time. This sounds like, like some cool fucking people <laughs> in the 1940s, man. Yeah. They're doing like, they're f having fucking drug orgies in the 1940s. <laughs> I, that goes way back though. That's what I mean. That it's like, I, I kind of feel like people thought that shit didn't happen until the yeah. 1960s, no. but I'm like, hmm. That shit goes back to the Roman era. Well, yeah. And even even in the young United States, I mean, the 1920s were pretty fucking crazy, yeah, yeah. too. Like, all the fucking drinking and shit. There like was also stuff back. going on in the 1700s. There were many sexual revolutions. Mm -hmm. Lots of them. The oh, late, yeah. In the 1770s here in the United States, during the time of the American Revolution, that was also a time of a sexual revolution going on. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin was into all that nudism and free love and... Oh, yeah. Never got married. You know, all kinds of stuff. Had a bunch of girlfriends. Well, I think, I mean, free love has been advocated since, I mean, shit. There was like, at least like the late 19th century at H.G. Wells, like people like that, Mary Wollstonecraft, like uh, people like that, who was Mary Shelley's mom. Um, you know, people like that, like advocating, not so much for just like fucking everybody indiscriminately, but for being able to have relationships inside and outside of marriage without it being um, like made illegal. You know what I mean? So like I said, Jack Parsons was actually, he was a big advocate of sexual freedom of women's rights of yeah. things like that. So he was like very much at the vanguard. Of I got to show my boy on there. Look, check that out. That's fucking Charles Bronson, man. He was, <laughs> oh, your shit went. Oh, okay. uh, he was jacked. Hold on. You can't really see his arms in there. Hold on. I oh, mean, the lag is getting me. <laughs> there you go. You he was it. sucking jacked, man. Let's go ahead and find a better. Look at his pipe. Oh, 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 there you go. There you go. Bigger. <laughs> there you go. I'm just laughing at the pipe. Is what I'm laughing. Yeah. You can't see his arm in that picture, but not through the camera. But he was fucking a lot bigger than people think he was. Well, yeah, like I said, because they always put it like in the Death Wish movies, which is probably yeah. what he's best known for. They kind of just put him in like long sleeve suits, right? Here, here's a good picture of him. Michael Schaefer says, stabbing my eyes out thinking of Ben Franklin nude, right? That might have been. That might have been like some fucking. <laughs> he was fucking jacked, man. <laughs> you just got his crotch. Got his crotch. <laughs> I can't fucking do this shit. The lag's getting me. I know. I tried to like fucking. For the 70s, man, that was the shit. Dude's he didn't is look actually, like... yeah, he is actually much bigger than I. Dude did him not as. look like that in the 70s. Not like I've seen him in a lot of no. shit, but. You know. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So, like I said, in the 1940s, because Jack was. Um, you know, rocket scientist by day, sex magic occultist by night, FBI, kind of not having it. So um, they kind of put him under surveillance. So uh, he uh, gets laid off from uh, Aerojet, where he had been working uh, at that time. And he gets like paid off for the shares that he had invested in the company and they're basically like, yeah, get the fuck out of here because you're making us look bad with all your sex magic shenanigans. So at this point, Jack doesn't really, um, is not really having a job. I think what ended up happening to him, unfortunately, um, which happened to kind of a lot of similar types of people around this time period, especially during the McCarthy era, the era, the Red Scare and all that, was that he basically got blacklisted from working in rocketry at all. So he ended up later like working at gas stations and being like a car mechanic and shit like that, because he wasn't allowed. He was like blackballed. 
um, because of his association with Crowley, because of his, um, you know, former flirtation with Marxism, because of this, that, and the other. So they didn't really want him. They thought they didn't trust him. They thought that maybe he was a spy and shit like that, even though there's no evidence that he did anything like that. So saying something. no, Sandra, I don't, he didn't, uh, he wasn't native American. Charles Bronson, I think was Polish, wasn't he? I think if I remember correctly, I think he, I don't know if he was born in Poland or if it's just parents. No, I think his were parents Polish, were born Polish. in Poland. I think I, his parents I, might have been Polish. Or Poland or Czechoslovakia, something like that. He was Eastern he, European. He was Eastern I European. think yeah. I could be totally wrong he about might that. Not even been Russian, but I remember him being Eastern European or Poland. I don't know. Is that Eastern Europe? I guess maybe it is. Yeah. Yeah. My okay. stepmom's from Poland. Yeah. So I think he was, that's just off the top of my head though. That sounds correct, though. I, re yeah. I think I remember reading that somewhere, unless we both... Somebody's going Latvian, Lithu Lithuanian. Yeah, it was something yeah, like that. Yeah, some something like that. I, it might have been Lithuanian or something. I'm sure people in Latvia are going, we're not Poland, yeah, motherfucker. But, <laughs> but Sorry. You always kind of picture, always kind of picture Bronson being this fucking craggly face, kind of smaller guy that really not real physical. No, that motherfucker was jacked. Yeah. He was jacked, man. But they never showcased that in any of his movies. Walking around, that dude was fucking big, man. Big old arms on him. He was everything. hiding his light under a bushel. It looks, it, it looks, I don't want to say it looks like anabolics, but maybe. I don't know. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Yeah. I mean, he was young in that picture. It, maybe not. It might have just been lifting. Lithuanian, but, somebody says. Yeah, I think it might have been a Lithuanian, right. That's, yeah, that sounds right. He was I knew badass, though. Badass little yeah. dude. He's not tall. I think he was five, 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 six. But yeah, stacked. Same height. Well, that's you're five six, right? Yeah, five six. Yeah, yeah, about the same size as me. I'm five foot three. He's in better shape than me, though. Fucking in that picture, he's lean. I got ten pounds to lose easy. If I were to lose ten pounds, I'd probably look like that. Maybe. Tim, his legs don't match. Somebody said, <laughs> "Whose legs don't match?" So he said, "It's anabolics. His legs don't match." Uh, no. Nah, Internet says he was five foot nine. No, not true. Not true. I don't know. I kind of feel like they He's always sure, tried they, they to always like exaggerate. I always now see now I want to go to Tom Cruise's Wikipedia page and see yeah. what his thing says. Tom Cruise is about five, 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 six. And, and the thing, well, I see now this always kind of bothered me. It always bothered me that dudes were so insecure about their height. It really, I mean, it's like a fucking, it's like a fucking arm. It doesn't race. matter. You know what I mean? I mean, I well, maybe maybe to some chicks it matters. It yeah. I it honestly never even occurred to me. You can look to at, care about it. <laughs> it can, honestly never did. I I've, I've always heard that Charles Bronson was about 55565 five, 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 around that around that era around, around that size. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't look very big. Wiki time. says he was born in the U.S. I thought he might have been born in the U.S., but yeah. I thought his parents were, his parents from, were somewhere from, else, from somewhere else. Were immigrants, yeah. Right. That's what I thought. We're just talking about his ethnic background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking it was Polish, but it might have been Lith Lithuanian. Sounds about right. He was something kind of Eastern European y kind of. Now, uh, what? Oh, what's his name? Yul Brenner was part Mongolian. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. I think, I think his parents were from Mongolia, I think. Mark but... says height doesn't matter, only money and dong. Exactly. <laughs> And other, mouth and how much you can talk. Yeah, other things matter too. Um, yeah. You dress fucking badass, and if you money's nice, talk dong is nice, but charisma. Yeah, I I think actually, if you don't have either money or dong, um, you need some like fucking personality, and that will take you a long way. Like I said, depends on the chick, but I don't really. I've never really had. I just like the people that I like. I don't really care about how much money they have or how big their dick is or anything like that. And so it's just never been a consideration. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm just saying. Right. In my in my in my observation of dudes that fucking do well, it's always charisma. Exactly. Well, that's what it's I'm saying. It's Always charisma. But the thing is, be though, funny or be sweet right. or be something. There's just, a bunch of shit. But the thing yeah. is, is that a guy who has charisma, not only does it work on women, it usually works on men too. It so, works on everybody. So what ends up happening is they tend to be successful also. Because you're a likable everybody, person. Because everybody's helping you. They like you. They want you to hire you. They be likable. That's the yeah. long and short of it. Just be a likable person. They want to work with you. They want you to be represent them with this and that, blah, blah, blah. But charisma is more important than anything. Anything. Yeah. Everything's charisma. Yeah. Like I yeah. said, have a good personality. Be a right. cool person. Right. Just be cool. You know? Yeah. Be interesting. 
listen I mean, to people when they talk to you. Do shit like that. It's like, it's easy. It's easy. Every man that was successful did it on the back of charisma, unless he inherited the money. And then that's not his success. That was his ancestor's success. Right. Just look at Arnold. Arnold had fucking charisma. Everybody liked him, even though he was stuck up. And he looked a certain way. He ended up being the governor of California. They laughed at him when they said he when he said he was going to be a famous actor. Yeah, because no, he was that he, accent, motherfucker. Yeah he, yeah, he conquered fucking Hollywood. Another and, thing, and you it was all charisma. Another thing you have to do too, and this is probably like an, an aspect of charisma, is that you have to take what other people maybe would perceive as a weakness, like Arnold did. With, like he has a really thick accent, yeah, and turn it into a strength. That became Arnold, right? Yeah. Make that like part of you. Right. That's your thing. And if you listen to people who knew Arnold, what you see in the movies, that's not the way Arnold was. Ar Arnold was. Arnold was not serious. He was not this. In the movies, he's kind of an archetype. He's almost kind of a car cartoon. That's not the way he really was in, in real life. In real life, he was a fucking prankster. And he was fucking joking around and would fucking talk a lot of shit. And he, he had a lot of charisma. People liked him. Even though in the bodybuilding scene, he... A lot of people, a lot of guys fucking said he was stuck up and fucking talked a lot of shit because he was in a competition constantly. Yeah. You know, and, but if he wasn't competing, if you weren't, if you weren't competing against him, he'd be joking around with you. Yeah. And that's the kind of guy he was. He, I kind of feel funny. like I don't really like, I don't like arrogance unless you're self aware of your arrogance and you're just doing it ironically. <laughs> But if you're just arrogant and you actually do think that you're better yeah. than everybody, then no, I just want to punch you in the now, face. Now, Jenny said that in, on, in the movies, Arnold is not a very sexy guy. and he, He's not, really. He's, he's not, not. No, I don't find him. He's not. He's, not, he's funny and he's yeah. like interesting and he's yeah. like a good character and stuff. But sexually attractive, not yeah. really. But you know what's funny is that I saw some behind the scenes clips of him hanging out with the girl from Predator 1. Yeah. And she's fucking grabbing up on him because she's a famous actress somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, she's been in tons of shit. Yeah, and like he's that. he's n nothing like he is in the movies. You can see that in, in reality, he is very attractive. Women like him. And he doesn't, the way he acts off screen is a lot more accessible. I, guess I don't, maybe. I'd have to meet him. No, in yeah, it's in person. He's he, he's very natural. Because, like I said, it's it's hard to. It's not the way. It's not what you see in in, on, in the movies. Right, and for me, like I said, particularly being a woman, and maybe this is a generalization, yeah. but it's like unless I know that person like in person, I don't know if they're sexually attractive or not because like I don't know you. So it's like if I just see you up on the screen, yeah, you can look sexy and everything like that. But if I meet you and you're a dick, then suddenly you're not sexy anymore. He was acting real natural. She was fucking definitely into him. Definitely. And he was okay. Well, very, like, that's fair enough. I mean, nothing, like I said, I've never met him in real life, yeah. so I don't know. No, he was just fucking being cool and fucking joking. He might be him. totally sexy yeah, if yeah. you meet him in real life. He I'm just saying, in the movies, he he's doesn't not. strike. Like, I'm not saying that it's not. Oh, what happened? Good oh, I thought you dropped your drink. I was no, like, no. oh no. no. <laughs> so no, much liquor. So much liquor wasted. No, my but yeah, I, I, you know. In the movies, I'm just saying I never found him like personally. It's not my type, really. I mean, yeah. I don't, I don't know. I don't have a type, but in real life, he evidently was very popular with the women. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I buy it. Yeah. I'm kind of a weirdo. Yeah. I yeah, mean, you weird. know. Yeah, yeah, you're weird. He tells me this all the time. Everybody's saying uh, Lithuanian. I'm an out. I'm an outlier. Charles Bronson was Lithuanian. Okay. At least that, in, yeah, in, that in, sounds that sounds right. ethnic background. Yeah. That sounds about right. Because I yeah I knew he wasn't, you know I thought I thought he was from here, but I knew his parents were probably not from here. So okay, so like I said, Jack Parsons, um, he gets in trouble with the FBI. They start stalking him for his whatever the hell he's doing, and he loses his job. So he starts uh, getting like even more into the occult and getting more into that shit, and then he meets. The famous L. Ron Hubbard. Now, L. Ron Hubbard at this point had not started Scientology yet. Okay. Yeah. This is still the 1940s. And we've had all kinds of shows on Scientology. We've had the aggregate Pope on here. And He's everything. been on here like three times. I'm actually an admirer of L. Ron Hubbard for what he was able to achieve just by telling a good story. I don't like Scientology. I don't like the Church of Scientology. I don't like David Miscavige and what they do. But the best thing about Scientology was L. Ron Hubbard. Everybody, he, everybody liked him, and he was 
Well, except for Jack Parsons. Except Jack Parsons. Because he but, stole a bunch of his money. But pretty much everybody, girlfriend. everybody, all the cultists in Scientology liked him. And he didn't really abuse women or anything. You know, and he had the opportunity to. He was a very unique cult leader. Um, he was surrounded by young Scientology girls. And he wasn't getting it on with them or abusing them. Not that anyone ever has said. Everyone says no. And I kind of believe that because that's how weird he was. <laughs> A that's, normal, what I, that's what's weird about it. In, the, in a way, that it. makes me even more suspicious. Yeah, because a, a real cult leader would have been dogging them all out. And, and, and it's like, out. that's not good either. But that's the not fact that either, he's not doing that is almost weirder. It's almost weirder, right? Because that's the fucking stereotype. He actually believed his own bullshit. I believe that he believed Which to me bullshit. is crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. And he was just kind of a... Medi that dude was a fucking lunatic. He was a mediocre I, naval naval commander of a fucking what was it, a destroyer in World War II that didn't see much action. I don't think he saw any action. I he mean, be a war hero though. To his credit, um, he did write a voluminous amount of sci-fi, uh, which was very like, yep. fairly well regarded, and it sold a lot. Um. I, you know, I have maybe a biased opinion because, like I said, I have firsthand experience with a Scientologist because I lived in Clearwater and I worked for a company that was owned by them. And um, so I had to read L. Ron Hubbard's uh, dribblings pretty yeah. much every working day of my life. And I felt like it was making me leak IQ points yeah. daily. So, uh, <laughs> and making me crazy at the same every time. Every time I met a Scientologist fucking and i ran across a couple of them one time at starbucks and i was just i was like i was thrust into a fucking parallel universe i didn't know what i was dealing with the insanity do you but see then i realized that they were scientologists they're yeah. fucking retarded man i told but, you um, i told you can you yeah. imagine i could only stay at that company for eight months can you yeah. imagine five days a week eight nine hours a day yeah interacting with people like that yeah for all that time. They think I they mean, know everything and they don't fucking know what they're talking about. They're and like, those kind of people irritate me yeah. more than any. And a lot of people irritate me. Okay, let's be honest. But nobody irritates me more than stupid people that think they're smart. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. That makes me so angry. Yeah. <laughs> LARPing that they have special And that's powers. exactly what Scientologists are. And yeah. I think that's exactly why after eight months, I was like, I got to get the fuck out of here or yeah. I'm going to jump off a building. I mean, I really couldn't take it. Yeah. I, I kind of, I kind of think Scientology kind of, that could have been something, but they tried to make an alternative to psychology and psychiatry. And they tried to make something that was better than psychiatry or psychology, but it didn't work. I mean, I don't Obviously. really. Obviously. <laughs> psychology oh, is not really a science. I think that's also kind of a philosophy more than anything else. It's hard, difficult to prove what people think. Um, psychiatry is a science. Doesn't Just because it's a science doesn't mean it's good. I think there's a lot of abuses in psycho psychology and psychiatry. I kind of stay away from that shit. I think it's a lot of witch doctory in a lot of it. Um, taking mind altering drugs to solve problems. Unless you're fucking crazy, I think it's a bad well, idea. Well, some people need it. Some people are fucking crazy. Some people need it. They used to give them fucking lobotomies. And instead of that, they just give them like a chemical lobotomy. I understand that. Because some people just, you just can't let them walk around. They're fucking crazy. But giving them everybody all these weird fucking psychotropic drugs and fucking weird neural inhibitors instead of just dealing with the problem of it. Look, you're depressed because your life sucks. Let's fix your life. You know what I mean? That's, that's really the, they're just making money off selling drugs to people. Really? Yeah. Because the thing about it is that people who actually suffer from depression, yeah. it's not anything to do with their situation. They could be in a good situation, could, but they're still, but they're still right. depressed because it's a brain chemical thing. So it's like, I understand Freaking, like, yeah, it's, in some circumstances, you, you know, you might need something like that. But I think in general, I think there's a lot of abuse of it. Too. Yeah. I, but I'm just, I'm not going down the Scientology road of like, nobody needs drugs. Everybody just needs to like no. fucking no. fast in a hotel room until, no, you, ain't gonna work. until you die of starvation and get eaten by cockroaches. Right. Like, like, oh, what's her name? Yeah. yeah. It's like that. They hand that shit out like candy to too many people. Yeah, I just think they over... there's profit in it. Right. 
Um, but, but I don't think that means that it doesn't have any value right. because obviously it does to a lot of people. Thank you very much, bro. So, oh, thank you, Nico. Thank you. What can we expect from a world ruled by psychos uh, whom ourselves vote in? I don't know. Yeah, I think I yeah, was saying voting matters. When I was saying that um, that the people I hated most were yeah. stupid people that thought they were smart, Alex Rivera said, I think that's most people. I was like, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm starting to think so as well. <laughs> but it's just like i don't well because i think the thing about it and let, we should do a whole fucking show about the dunning kruger effect because i feel like people that don't that just know a little bit about something yeah are like really dangerous because they just know a little bit about something so they think they know everything whereas people who are actually smart and actually know about things know that there's a shit ton of stuff they don't know so they tend to be a lot more humble um, and not like jump into like, oh, I know everything about everything. So it's so I feel like Dunning Kruger is just everywhere. And I just feel like and it's just that makes me matter than anything else. And Scientologists, they have this weird thing, like the ones that I worked with, even the ones that were because, like I said, they're kind of into child labor. Let's say that. So some of the well, people that. Right. So some of the people that were working in this company, like in managerial positions, were like 16. Yeah. So you have some 16 year old idiot telling you what and they're looking at you all fresh faced and wide eyed mm. and like telling you this bullshit. And I'm just looking at them going. What the fuck do you like, you know, nothing about anything. I mean, like, think, why are you, I mean, like, you question them? I think there's something wrong with you. Exactly. And what, that just, oh, it's crazy making. Yeah. It's crazy making. What's weird about Scientology is Scientology is a very 1950s Cold War feeling religion. Oh, big time. Big time. It's very, very corporate. It, yeah. You take the corporate because it, it has a military background. L, L. Ron Hubbard was a military officer. This came from an era where the military and the corporations were merging. And the military really liked the way corporations did things. So it started to take on like a corporate fate, face. So it kind of made sense to make a religion that was corporate and kind of merged in with some kind of like psychology, but also something kind of like uh, magic in a way. Yeah. And it kind of had the same, kind of, kind of had the same game that fucking old, uh, fucking Aleister Crawley had with the OTO where you paid them and they'd make you a fucking wizard basically is what it is. Well, and I mean, L. Ron and Hubbard got most of got his that ideas idea. from Crowley. From Crowley, right. Sure. So you join Scientology and you pay them and they train you to become a super Scientologist and so you could eventually become a wizard. Yeah, you're essentially a, a wizard. A, a 1950s era <laughs> Cold War space wizard kind of like a Jedi. That's what they're doing. You're, you're, you're paying to become a Jedi. Which I get that. Like, look, and everybody wants to better themselves. Everybody wants to think that, you know, if I just like work hard at this specific thing, like my life will be happy. Like I'll, I'll be yeah. successful. I'll be rich. I'll be this, that, and the other. But sometimes shit doesn't work out the way right. you want. And you it, can't like force it. You can't as, do that. As you're moving up the bridge, you go through these different courses. All right. And uh, what do they call it? Oh, you go through these OT levels. Right. And as you go through operating the theta. Uh, operating theta, operating which, theta which levels. OT and sure. each each level, you got to pay a certain amount of money to pass through to the next level. It's making a motherfucker a wizard. That's the same thing fucking Crowley would do. Well, it's okay until you probably get to like OT4 and then you realize what, the, I think it was OT4 or OT5. What is it? I can't remember what, I thought it was OT8, but I could, OT8. Be, I could be wrong. I no, I'm talking about the ones where you find out it's basically about alien souls. I thought that was OT8. Was it eight? eight I thought, okay. but I could be wrong about that. I could be remembering it So wrong. you pay tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then they tell you, guess what? And guess what? There's demons, there's demons in and, a volcano and yeah. then it came and there's Xenu. And what you find out is you find out that it's it's a religion that is based around demonic possession, all right? That you've been demonically possessed by alien souls that have Man, to be exercised out of you. I hate when that happens. And they exercise these alien souls out of you by basically going through confession 
on a lie detector. And now, you know, it's, it's or a lie cans. It, it, it's a lie. It's a very primitive lie detector machine. And you're giving up all your fucking secrets and confessing all these sins and they're recording them. Mm -hmm. That way, if you leave, they got dirt on you and they can fucking release that to the public. Oh, well, he's a homosexual, which like that's a bad thing in fucking Scientology. They, matter of fact, try to cure gay gayness. They do. That's they why that. John Travolta's in there. It's like pray the gay away. Yeah, actually. praying the gay away, you know. And, I'm not down um, with that, man. Yeah, so that's why they can't leave. I think there's only one person that actually got in modern... Which is dumb, because it's like, dude, it's 2020. Okay? Not in Scientology, though. Uh, yeah, no shit. Not in Scientology. In Scientology, it's 1956. Yeah, no shit. Yeah, that's, that's it, the problem with yeah. it right there. That was a long time ago. Yo. Now, some people want to talk about Tom Cruise. <clears throat> I do not believe... I do not believe that... Well, first of all, I believe that Tom Cruise got top Scientology training. I think he his experience in Scientology was probably the best experience you could get. They That's fucking, what I mean. He didn't get shit on like all no. the fucking peons. They treated that motherfucker like a king. Right. They built whole fucking special bases for Tom Cruise to go. Bitch, he goes to yeah. like a certain place and they're like, well, he likes this particular type yeah. of flower, so we're just going to make whole a whole field, field of this flower so yeah. him and Nicole Kidman, because this is when they yeah, were married, they, were they could frolic in this yeah. field of flowers. They planted the whole yeah. fucking field yeah. so he could do that. Now, Scientology isn't a fucking two-bit operation. They got military, like military-style bases all over well, fucking they're hidden and shit. Real estate, real estate magnates, yeah. pretty much. They got a fucking secret base out in the middle of the desert armed with it looks like a maximum security prison huge fucking walls and fucking concertina wire and there's an underground vaults filled with fucking l ron hubbard's writings on fucking what is it fucking lead tablets or platinum and platinum no it's not platinum i don't remember what it is it's some kind of fucking metal with uh, titanium Titanium. Titanium tablets. I was thinking of platinum, right? And they're all fucking stored and <laughs> all these fucking it can it can the thing can survive a nuclear fucking blast. You know what I mean? To to uh, and it's all of fucking L. Ron Hubbard's fucking Dianetics. I'm telling shit. you right now, Scientology yeah. is exhibit one in why yeah. people that have money like don't deserve that shit. <laughs> and you know what I mean? And that's just because there's a weird undercurrent in like particular i don't know about other countries but in american culture that if you have money then you must have deserved it somehow like you're better or you must have deserved it somehow i'm like scientology is like exhibit a and why that is not true well <laughs> scientology was run on what was called whales <sighs> and whales, well yeah whales are sucker donors that'll give stupid out rich people that will yeah. just give all their money give hundreds of thousands of dollars to, this. to be made into a wizard and uh, then they started doing all these <sighs> real estate deals and they turned the whole fucking thing into an empire. It makes me so sad. But they had whole fucking bases built to fucking Tom Cruise. Now, oh, why yeah. is Tom Cruise in there? First of all, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say, you know, some people say, well, he must have been in there praying the gay away. It, it, unanimously, everybody says Tom Cruise is not gay. That's John Travolta probably John is. John Travolta, probably. yeah. Yeah. Well, Every, everybody I have, who knows, him I have says, that. I mean, I'm not saying like any, and like, there's nothing wrong with that. I just wish he would come he's out. He's in the it. closet. I look, my aunt was, she did like yeah. facials and hair and stuff and yeah. in Port Orange and John Travolta used to have a house in Port Orange and he used to come into her salon all the time. And everybody that worked in that salon and she told me, my aunt told me, she's like, that dude is gay as shit. Gay as shit. Everybody in yeah. the salon said that. Tom, Tom's straight. I think what happened with Tom is when Tom became a big star, people don't realize that Tom is from very humble origins. He claims that they cleared him, they cured him of dyslexia. I believe that something like that might be true. But was it dyslexia or was it just a really bad education? Maybe he couldn't read too well. It doesn't mean that he is not. A, Tom Cruise is very intelligent. Well, dyslexia and uh, intelligence are very, not or, related. Or the same thing, like I said before, maybe illiteracy doesn't necessarily mean a person isn't intelligent. No, isn't, those isn't. are two completely different things. Because uh, I knew a guy who was, uh, was one of my dad's friends was basically functionally illiterate. He ran a fucking multi-million dollar company, but he learned to read later. Yeah, that's came, what I mean. It's, he, <laughs> but he came, came from very humble backgrounds. And Hi, sweetie. 
dropped out of school young and fucking was a fucking problem child and never learned to really read. Um, it comes, with, it comes, Katie. Anyway, um, she's kidding. I don't think he, Hi, I don't Sandy. think his reading skills were real good. And I think they kind of completed his education and he was already a famous actor. He, I think he wanted to be in the army or do something military. He didn't want to pretend to be a fighter pilot and a hero. He wanted to be the real thing. But you can't do that when you're a fucking actor. You can't, I'm going to leave for fucking three years and join the army. But you can do it in fucking Scientology. What you doing, Pope? I'm sticking her butt. This kitty is, come, come down here. Come She's down. like, <laughs> you can see a little. Just a picture. tail coming up. It's just a tail. I think. She's Tom, like, what? <laughs> I think Tom, first of all, got class A treatment. Uh, in Scientology, in the Church of Scientology. And I think they gave him kind of a paramilitary experience because they do have a paramilitary wing called the uh, the Sea Org. And it's... <laughs> stop it. Bye, Pookie. But, um, you know, uh, sorry, we're getting distracted. <laughs> Pookie's climbing um, all over the desk. Scientology, because L. Ron Hubbard was a naval commander, Scientology is basically kind of like, uh, set up like the Navy. They even wear it Navy is, uniforms do, and yeah. stuff or at least the, uh, the Sea Org does. So uh, was he a member of the Sea Org? I don't think so. Who? Tom. No. No. But I think he has the right to fucking wear a uniform, though, doesn't he? Well, they kind of let Tom do, do whatever, whatever he fuck wants he wants. Him. Right. Because he's Tom fucking Imagine free. the Navy, but it's mixed with the fucking Jedi. That's what they, that's what they think that they're doing. And they do have guns. They yeah. have guns. Ryan Schwartz says the Tom Cruise video where he says he's the only one who could save people in an accident. Exactly. Exactly. That made me exactly. that made me laugh and want to throw up at the same time. A Scientologist time. knows what to do when they see a car. And accident. no one else does. No one else does. Obviously. He's see, this, this is exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. Exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. These types of people infuriate yeah. me. Yeah. And Scientologists are like infuriate that. Infuriate. But what's funny is that the average Scientologist is a dude that joins a cult. And a dude that joins the cult is a loser. Yeah. You're a fucking LARP and a loser. I can't get down with that. Right. Just why? Why? So. How messed up does it, your life have to yeah, be? Yeah, you're a loser. You know, now a lot of Scientologists. That's not going to make now, it better. Scientology has been around long enough to where a lot of people that are in it are born into it. That's Which is the, scary. And that's the way religions dude. grow. Okay. Oh my God. So read, as long as they're reproducing, the religion grows where you don't need to recruit new blood. Read the book by Jenna Miscavige. Yeah. It's called Beyond Belief. It yeah. is the one of the most horrifying things I have ever read. She is the niece of David Miscavige and she was raised in the shit. Like she was born in the Church of Scientology. She didn't know anything different, but she got the fuck out when she was in her 20s. And it is horrifying. I read some of it to you, didn't yeah. I? Because I was like, listen to this shit. Problem with oh, Scientology horrifying. is not so much Scientology; it's the practices that they think that they have to do for certain things to happen. They're constantly on the verge of exercising a motherfucker, and their exorcisms might kill you. I can exercise. I'm you not gonna exercise a motherfucker. They lock you up in a maximum security facility somewhere. Yeah, and they have brutal discipline, like the Navy, but they do it for life. And it's weird, man. They have Billion prison compounds contract. and shit. Yeah. But, they, they, but if you were to go into those prison compounds to free them, they wouldn't want to leave because it's their religious choice to be there, they say. Yeah. It's weird, man. Weird stuff. But that's their, they want to do it, whatever. Yeah. Somebody but said uh, Somebody said about Leah Remini. It's like, I really do recommend. Um, she is a former Scientologist. She used to be in it and she got out. And now she's made like a series about it which mm. is really good. I've seen like most of it. I don't know if they've done a new yeah. season, but I saw like all of it up to now. And it's like really, really good. A lot I mean, of the problem with science. It's crazy shit. Crazy. A lot of the problems with Scientology, I think could be traced back to David Miscavige. He's kind of a brutal li leader. He's a dictator. Yeah. Of Scientology. He's calling him chairman of the board. COB, what they call him. It wasn't like that under L. Ron Hubbard. It's just that, you know, when Elron, when, when, when Hubbard died, you know, uh, Miss Cabbage took over and he ran a, he ran it in a kind of a fucked up way. He was a tyrant. His, even yeah, his son that, says, even his that dad, dude is, his dad says so. Man, that dude is. I think eventually fucking. Something else. 
Scientology is not going away. It's going to be here for a long, long time. But I don't. I think it will chill out. Their membership has been declining. Yeah, happily. It'll always be around. Though. I mean, they have a shit ton of money. Yeah. So you know, they have that going. They for have them. an empire of empty buildings. <laughs> I know it's so weird. With little headsets, so you can listen to fucking L. Ron Hubbard's fucking communication. I, seriously, I'm just like course. so. It just, it's one of the things, I guess because I experienced it personally and I went through like almost a year of my life was like dealing with this bullshit when I didn't really want to and I just, because I just needed a fucking paycheck. And like having to go every day and like the first half hour of every work day, you had to go in this like study room and like read the brilliant master, like L. Ron Hubbard's like yeah. fucking works. They said, like, when you first started working there, and like I said, I needed a check, so don't judge me. But, um, you know, they, they made you sign a thing. They're like, look, we're not trying to, like, we're Scientologists. We're not, like, trying to convert you to our, because I'm sure their lawyers threw that shit up. We're not trying to convert you, blah blah But they were kind of on the DL. So they would make you go in first half hour of every workday from 8.30 to 9 or from 8 to 8.30. I don't really remember. You had to go in the little study room, and you had to read through L. Ron Hubbard's, uh, you know, business courses. You had to write essays. You had to, like, do tests. You had to... Because, like, seriously, I didn't know that much about Scientology at the time. So I'm in there, and I'm just, like, writing fucking bullshit. I'm like, whatever. Just, like, fucking stop. Can I just please do my job? It's like, what is this bullshit? Because I don't like extraneous, you know... So I'm doing that. And then I look in the back and I see these two guys and they're making fucking like little dudes out of clay. Yeah. They're postulating. Huh? And they're like, f like arguing with like talking to one another. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like looking back on, Oh my God, what the fuck is going they on back there? Everything they do with little fucking clay. Dolls. I'm like, are you, I'm like, did I, am I in kindergarten again? Or yeah. why are we yeah. talking to each other with clay figures? Yeah. What is happening? Yeah. So I ask somebody, like I kept, I didn't say anything in there. I get back up to the office. Cause like all the other graphic designers that I worked with were not Scientologists. One of them was a Jehovah's witness actually. Um, but the other two were atheists. So I'm talking to them like, what the fuck? Why were they making people out of clay? I'm like, I yeah. thought that I was like on a fucking like kids show for a second. And they were like, yeah, um, their big thing is they think that you can't just like imagine stuff. You have to like have a physical representation. If you have, if you're like mad at somebody, you have to like make a clay figure of you and make a clay figure of the person that you're mad at. And then you have to like pretend that you're like arguing. <laughs> Yeah, there's like a, there's like a, I think they call it postulating, isn't it? Yeah, or something. Postulate. Like, I can't remember the word. They it's, it's. I was like, really? Really? This is my life? Yeah, they do fucking Oh my shit. God. So I was just kind of everything like. Everything is a LARP and overcomplicated oh, and rehearsed. And everything I is, hate that Everything shit. is kind of canned. It. And they constantly judge each other based on their performance of how the conversation went. It's, it's making a big deal out of nothing and trying to make very basic everyday things some kind of a fucking performance is what it's what it's trying to do exactly is, is what they're trying to do i was just kind of like and another thing they did too the, which, break, hold on. which another thing they did too which drove me fucking insane was that like i said i'm a graphic designer okay it's like we worked the the company that i worked for i can't even remember what they were called Agent Media Corporation. I don't think they're in business anymore. But um, it didn't have anything to do with Scientology. It was basically like a business to business publishing company that had to do with like the insurance um, industry. Like you were selling, you were basically selling insurance agents. Like here's my package of like insurance stuff. Like here's my life insurance package, my health insurance package. So shit like that. So we were doing like direct mail shit, like magazines, crap like that. So there was four of us in the graphic design department. And it's like, so we didn't have anything to do with Scientology. But one thing that they were very big on was that they, you had to not only do your job, but you also had to, like, every single task had a point value. They had assigned a point value to every single task that you did in your job, everybody's job, no matter what it was. And you had to keep track of all the points that you accumulated during the week. Okay. 
and you had to keep a chart. Like it wasn't, it wasn't enough just to do your job and get the shit done and get the magazine published, get the, you know, direct mail uh, packet done. You, it, that wasn't enough. You also had to accumulate all your points together. And at the end of the day on Friday, you had to turn in your points. And then on Monday morning, you'd have a meeting and every single person had a chart and of your points. And if your points had gone up and they would show everybody's chart, and if the chart was up, everyone would applaud. And then if the chart was down, everyone would just like be silent and like stare at you in judgment, which I thought was the most ridiculous, pointless, stupid thing that I've ever had to endure. And that's saying something working in the corporate world. It just drove me fucking crazy. And honestly, like I'd only worked there like a week or two before I figured out it's like, oh, well, they just want the shit to go up every week. So I'm just going to make fucking shit up, which is what everyone else was doing. Yeah. So it's like, why? Do you need to take a break at all? It was no, I'm okay. fine. It was completely fucking pointless because everyone at the end of the week would just be like, yeah, um, I made two more points this week than last week yeah. because nobody wanted everybody to like stare at them at the Monday morning meeting. Like oh, you, the, oh, the you didn't make, yeah. The constant growth. They expected that you would just keep going up and up, up, and up, and up and like up and you up. could just go up forever. Yeah. Which I made the mistake one time because I'm kind of uh, a sarcastic asshole, as you know. Yeah. So I made the mistake of one of the stupid essays that we had to write. And I made like a snarky comment about how you could just like keep going up forever, like into infinity. Yeah. I don't remember exactly what I said, but I made like some smart ass comment. Like like that. That no, they did not. Yeah. I was brought into the office and had to explain myself. Yeah. And like, it was just like, Dumb you know, asses. but yeah. So after a while, like after eight months, I was finally like, I got to get the fuck out of here. And I just like moved out of Clearwater entirely because I was getting paranoid. Yeah, Clearwater is owned by Scientology. I couldn't even go to the grocery store without thinking that you, everybody was. You explain Clearwater to them? Scientology. Yeah. It's like, it, they, that's like Scientology Central. They even fucking control the police, basically. More or less. I mean, they own a lot of the real estate yeah. downtown. It's a beautiful place. There's a beach. There's everything like yeah. that. But I just couldn't. After I worked there, I just couldn't live there anymore because right. I mean, I just had a, like a tiny apartment, but I yeah. just couldn't live there anymore. So we had to go off on that tangent because Jack Parsons, this motherfucker here, a cult rocket scientist, runs in to LRH, L. Ron Hubbard, one of the biggest fucking before cultists, he started Scientology. Before he started yes. science, one of the biggest when he was just ever. a sci-fi writer and runs into Anton LaVey. Church of Scientology. Well, Alistair, Cro later. Alistair Crowley. Was well, it Alistair Crowley? No, yeah. I thought it was. I thought well, it was, Anton LaVey wasn't that was really. Later. That was later, and that, that was wasn't, later. Okay. That wasn't really like. But out of them all, out of them all, L. Ron Hubbard was the most successful. He's the one that had all the bank. That dude had fucking a lot of money. Well, yeah. Later on, I mean, I guess he wasn't that. He stupid, died old, green, tooth, toothless motherfucker. On he wasn't back. stupid, but all the people that follow him are clearly stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, well, I, was, I don't, I don't have any patience for that kind of stuff. I Scientology just was pre-internet. Information was hard to find, difficult to debunk shit. No. So what's people's excuse nowadays? No, no. Uh, well, it's because it's been there for so long. Now it's, well, it's been around <laughs> a long time. It's got to be true. It's a UFO cult, basically. Uh -huh. Um, but you couldn't check, couldn't fact check anything back then. People kind of had paranormal beliefs. It was more common. And uh, he evidently put on a great show. Everybody liked him. I think that had a lot to do with it. It was just his charisma. People liked him. I don't know why. Even though he had that weird mouth. He had a weird mouth. and he I can't get past sound. the mouth. It was a different era. It was a different time. Well, you got to understand that. He's always like putting his, like, his, poking his lips out. His he's, like, audience it's was, really unsettling. was not a very sophisticated audience, you know. And um, it was just another time. And they were already kind of LARPing, you know, so they're just yeah. lapping it up. He's kind of trying to sell them powers of the mind. And they didn't know everything that he believed also. That's another thing. Yeah. He didn't find that out till like OT8. And that then was everybody's a UFO like, ah, oh, really? It's a UFO God call? God damn it. Yeah, that, that's what it was. I don't know. I've always been like, ever since I can remember, I've always been like a really big skeptic of anything that was like, 
you know, just do this thing. It'll make your life better. Do this. Not just, I'm always like really skeptical of that. He's a science shit. fiction writer. So like I said, that's why yeah. I don't think I could ever be like persuaded to join a cult because I'm just like immediately like somebody comes at me with, hey, like do this one thing and make your life better. I'm like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, I'll figure my own shit out. Thank you. But so, yeah, so Jack Parsons meets L. Ron Hubbard before L. Ron Hubbard started Scientology. I guess he didn't get that idea until later. So I don't know if it was Jack Parsons' idea or if it was L. Ron Hubbard's idea. But one of the things that they thought they were going to do, so they think they're going to do this ritual that's going to summon the goddess Babylon to Earth, who is kind of like your idealized woman um they called her the scarlet woman which i guess is kind of like the um that's kind of like the the symbol like in a lot of different belief systems for like you know free love or you know a a woman that's you know not like past religions kind of thing so they're trying to like have a ritual to bring this woman to earth apparently so they have this ritual. There's like some chanting, like some occult symbols they're drawing in the air with swords. Uh, they're dripping animal blood on the runes. They're jerking off uh, on various things. You know, it's like the masturbatory kind of magic. So, you know, they're attempting to bring this woman to fruition. Now, one thing that did happen that was interesting was that not too long after they did this, um, this chick showed up that actually Jack Parsons ended up marrying later on. Mm -hmm. I think that he had the perception that she was the woman that he had. That they called. That, yeah. Yeah. That they it was, she didn't know it at the time because she right. just happened to turn up. It was just a coincidence. But he was just like, oh, you must be Babylon. Yeah, that's like, right. In yeah. earthly form. That's right. I was thinking about Anton LaVey. Anton LaVey didn't meet Jack Parsons. No, that's, what, that's LaVey, why I didn't know what you were talking Anton about. Anton LaVey met L. Ron Hubbard later. Because I remember there was a LaVey-Hubbard connection, if I remember correctly. Yes? I can't remember. You don't remember? I, actually, I, think, no. I thought there was. I, I mean, there was. I like I said, I, I don't really remember. I think it was later, though. Yeah. 70s. Yeah. Okay, good. It might have been. I think so, yeah. So they do all this shit. Now, what L. Ron Hubbard ends up doing, he not only steals Jack Parsons' then girlfriend, who, as you'll remember, was the very young sister of his former <coughs> wife, uh, you know, Sarah Northrop. Now, L. Ron Hubbard eventually ended up marrying her later on, but he took off with the girlfriend. He also got Jack Parsons to invest almost $21,000 in a quote unquote boat business. Yeah. His idea was that they were going to buy like three yachts, I think it was, and they were going to like buy them and like refurbish them and resell them. Okay. But what ended up happening was that L. Ron Hubbard bought the boats and then took the fuck off. Yeah. So he basically made off with a bunch of Jack Parsons money. So he can go found fucking Scientology. And that, <laughs> yeah. And those boats would eventually be the foundation of the Sea Org okay, in yeah. Scientology later on. So this is yeah. where that connection is. Uh, now, Jack Parsons ended up having to sue L. Ron Hubbard yeah. and Sarah Northrup, his former girlfriend, who would later go on to marry L. Ron Hubbard to get some of the money back. But I think all that he got back was maybe like less than 3000 out yeah. of the almost 21,000 that he, now the boats invested. he bought, one of them wasn't the free wins. Was it? I don't know. It might've been yeah. because he did end up, but he did actually do what he said he was going to do. He did actually end up buying boats with the money, Yeah. but it was supposed to be a business. Like him and Jack Parsons were supposed to go in business. It was an investment, but he just took the money bought the boats, and then took the fuck off. See, Scientology has a ship. It's called the Free Winds. Yeah. And that was the one LRH he commanded it. When he when he had to go hide, he'd go out on the Free Winds. Yeah, because it's like, go hey, out. I'm in international, international waters, waters, bitch. Yeah. You can't do anything about it. I don't I think do anybody's fuck fucking taken it anywhere in a long, long time, but they still owed, owned it. It's like one of their religious relics, but it's like a roach-infested old fucking ship. It's, yeah. Yeah. It is, it's. That was probably nice back in the day, but... Well, you know. 
most people, yeah. most things are, like, I guess. There was all kinds of weird shit happened on that ship, too. Locking people up down the bilge and down the bilge pumps and fucking overnight. Honestly, like I said, I'm not big on conspiracy theories, but honestly, anything you tell me about Scientology, yeah. I'll probably believe it. Evidently, they had all kinds of weapons because they would go out to international waters. They had some fucking surface-to-air missiles, probably Stinger missiles or red-eye missiles, probably red-eye missiles. Yeah. hand launch shit. And a bunch of machine guns and stuff. That was evidently, but who knows if that's true. The FBI thought that. Yeah. Yeah, the FBI thought they had all kinds of shit out on there on it. Because you know, because um, the thing about it, like one of the company that I used to work for, you know the woman that, I mean, the Scientologist got in trouble for murdering? Or, I don't know if they, they didn't charge them with murder, but it was more like negligent homicide. Mm-hmm. Lisa McPherson. Yeah. She used to work at the company that I worked for in Clearwater. Mm. Yeah. And one of the, I, she was the finance manager or something like that. She was one of the managers was her roommate mm. and several of the managers and like people in higher positions there had actually testified at her trial, which I didn't find out until a couple months after I started working mm. there. Which, again, disturbed me a lot. Because, like I said, I'm not into conspiracy theories, but Scientologists are so crazy that anything that they do, like, if you would tell me anything they do, like, they killed this person or they had this person killed, I would probably buy that shit. Because those are exactly the kinds of people that would Back when we would ever fucking do a show about Scientology, in the comments section, there would be a bunch of people going, oh, I believe in freedom of religion. Fuck this shit. I'm I'm out of here. All these people are crazy. That's Scientologists. Scientology yeah. fucking... Well, they're, they're very transparent. They're, they're all not over very the internet. good at... Yeah. yeah, they're all over the internet, and fucking they try to turn everybody against you if you're talking bad about them. But I think they gave up. Scientology tried to beat the internet. They had a war against the internet. Which is hilarious. They didn't know what the internet because was. Because they were so behind. So behind the fucking... Like, as technology. They was. thought they were going to drive every all the fucking... Uh, 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 what they call them? SPs off the... Fu- suppressive person. Yeah. They can drive all the SPs all, right off the net. Yeah. You know, they won't be here anymore. Didn't work out that way. They didn't know what the internet was. That's what I mean. It's so the 90s. Fucking, I mean, fucking they fun. were still using fax machines, for fuck's yeah. sake. Okay. Telex. Telex. Yeah. Telex. In the 2000s. Telex in the late did. 2000s. Well, LRH told them to do it by Telex, so that's what they did. So that's what they did. Yeah. So they really thought... They did do the Telexes. <laughs> they didn't really get into the internet until, like, after everybody had already caught on to that shit. So it's like, they were, like, several years behind, yeah. and they still thought that they were going to be able to... I mean, I don't know about nowadays, but for a while, they would still... Like, if somebody said something against them, they would still, like, put up a website saying that you were a child molester or yeah. something like and everybody was so onto it yeah but they didn't realize that everyone was onto it which is like really funny they to fire me. your neighborhood and say how bad you were show up at your door yeah, somebody's mentioned it there is a, there is a good movie about l ron hubbard they couldn't say that it was about l ron hubbard because they don't want to get sued it's called the master yeah and, and, and it's good it's a real good movie and it basically tells the story and like I said, I think L. Ron Hubbard was an interesting guy. I, he didn't really do anything wrong. He was just a founder of this fucking weird ass religion. They like the, the the cultists liked him. That's the only thing that matters. I don't give a shit if you're in a cult. If you like it, then fine. All right. He wasn't hurting anybody. And it wasn't until later, towards the end times of the L. Ron Hubbard era, when he was getting kind of old that weird thing started happening in the church. And then when Miscavige took over, it started to get brutal. But during L. Ron Hubbard's time, there aren't any reports of any kind of abuse. Everybody seemed to like him. He was a weird dude. Interesting guy. Yeah. Uh, and he was a huckster. He was a huckster. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big time. Oh, yeah. But well, as far he as... The way I see it, he was, in a way, selling entertainment. These are LARPers. Yeah. Even the, the people joining the cult are LARPing. You know, they're hoping that it's true, but I don't think they cared whether or not it was actually true. They just liked the activity. Well, people just like the activity. And they like they like feeling like they're part of something. Yeah, and I think that had a lot to do I with it. I get that. I don't have that feeling, but um They have it. I don't get it, but okay. It. If if other people want to do they, that, it'd be like cool. 
they're playing Dungeons and Dragons, but it's real life. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to go to the bathroom. Oh. <laughs> I'll, I'll so babysit the kids. You got to babysit. I'm going to babysit. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So what's up with everybody? How much were the cult's fees? Uh, a lot. Uh, to get anything out. What they would do is they would bilk you constantly. If you were taking courses from them, you had to pay thousands of dollars for some kind of course. And then they would show up to your house and say, look, there's an emergency going on. you got to help us. you got to donate to the church. We have to stop this. And it'd be some kind of fucking cause. You know, the psychiatrists are taking over the drug and the kids. Or we have to build this new radio station that will broadcast the fucking truth to everybody. It was like any other fucking religion where they're constantly trying to get you to finance their efforts to save the world. Uh, but then they'd take the money and they'd buy fucking used shit and try to make... Okay, here's the weird. Okay, here's a good example of what they tried to do, or what they did do. They built millions of dollars out of whales, which are don't you know people that donated to the church, to buy the ability to print CDs. All right, and they were going to make CDs with all the fucking holy scriptures, you know, of L. Ron Hubbard on it, and they were going to give those out, I guess, for free. And to help save the world. But they were doing this in the 2000s at a time where CD technology was just like a, a thing of the past. And the equipment to make to mass produce these CDs was, they, it was all used. It was used equipment they were going to use. So they made millions and millions of dollars off their parishioners to make these fucking CDs. And then they would make runs and then they would fucking build more money on them. We need uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to make the CDs. And they would make millions of CDs. And the CDs would just sit there. But they weren't, they didn't give a shit about those CDs. They just wanted to get the money out of the parishioners. Yeah. And then they bought a fucking television studio, an old Hollywood television studio. They had that thing all decked out. They made the parishioners buy all that shit. Of course, they pocketed most of the money. Well, and, duh, yeah. That's, and now they have a television studio in the era of fucking YouTube. And they were doing this, they did this shit again. Like, they started a channel, right? Yeah, they have a channel. Nobody's seen this fucking channel. Where is this channel? It's I mean, here. it's on the cable. It's on cable. But nobody's watching that. Well, no. Nobody's why watching they? that. Nobody's Unless watching they're that. watching it like to be yeah. like for a joke, like and to they, make and, fun of it. And you you'd say, Well, that's crazy. That's millions and millions of dollars for television. They made money off of it from the parishioners. Not the not the channel. The channel doesn't make money. The channel loses money. They could have done the same thing with a fucking YouTube channel. All right. What they but they wouldn't have been able to raise cheaper. millions of dollars to start a YouTube channel. Yeah. Okay, that's the difference. So the idea, Scientology runs by bilking Scientologists. Well, yeah, that's it's, what it's it a does. pyramid scheme. It's like a pyramid scheme. I mean, you almost made me want to watch the Scientology channel, except not. I probably would not. Because I have candy ass. After like 10 minutes, I'd probably be like throwing shit. Very, <laughs> very candy ass mainstream fluff corporate commercial. That's what it's like watching how wonderful everything is. And they can save your that they're going to that they're going to save you. It's like it's worse than Christianity. Worse than Christianity. Honestly, it's though, worse. I kind of wish if I didn't have a conscience, which I do. Yeah. But um, I kind of wish I had thought of that shit back in the 90s or back when people were still dumb enough to fall for it. <laughs> I kind of wish I had like kind of, and then I could have made a few million dollars. I could retire. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It would have been nice. But I don't know. I can't bring myself to do that kind of shit. I'm, plus, I'm not good at bullshitting. So, so if you're poor, you can't join them? No. 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 They don't want poor people. They don't want poor people. They don't want poor people. If you're poor, you cannot be a Scientologist. They only want rich Bilbo Baggins looking motherfuckers in their fucking 50s and 60s that'll fall for this stupid shit. They're gonna it's alarming how many people that actually have money yeah. are dumb enough to fall for this shit. I guess yeah. it's not that alarming. It's like not well, that they make all kinds of promises that they can cure any disease, they can reverse aging, give you superpowers, give you psychic powers. If you're going blind, restore sight, everything. Every fucking thing. Anything can. Thank you, Bunyip. Thank you very much. <laughs> They're saying that. Read what it says. 
It's says, a Tom, mind over matter cult. Basically. I'd love you to do a show critiquing the selection process for various special forces units around the world. Uh, they are all going to be about the same. Well, no, they're not going to be about the same. <laughs> and it's also going to be uh, era dependent. Like what they're doing now, I don't know. It's The standards are going to be a lot easier today than they used to be because they gave the order to make more special forces troops here in the United States, which the only way to make more would be to lower the standards. During the time I was in, it was near impossible to, be, to, to get into SF. I only knew one dude that did it. And he was like an, a, a professional athlete, if you looked at him. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was looking at a guy who was on an anabolics. Um, but evidently, there, there's a lot more of them now. They're not as special as they used to be because the battlefields changed. Same thing back in Vietnam. It was hard to get good people. So the special forces of the Vietnam era, they did badass shit, but they were kind of regular looking guys. When I was in during the 90s, it was hard to get special forces. It was a select brotherhood. The last thing that they did was want new special forces guys. It was real small. Um, you wanted to get in there because when you got out, when you, first of all, an SF guy during the time I was in there fucking made 100000 a year. All right? As an Not active bad. duty. Yeah, 100000 And then when you got out, you'd make 150000 in private security. You know, so... It was the beginning of a fucking long career, that kind of shit. It's changed, though, now. You know, um, you can make a lot of a lot of money doing private contracting. As long as you have that DD-214 that said you serve, especially if it's infantry, you can go anywhere now. Make all kinds of money. You don't make money in the Army anymore. You make money when you get out. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the difficulty <clears throat> level goes up and down. I'd probably say... Over the years, the hardest one to get into, the most fucking, the one that's probably the most sketchiest over the years would have been the FFL, French Foreign Legion. Pretty fucking sketchy. Kind of badasses, though. It's kind of like being in a maximum security prison. There are prisoners. I had heard that, yeah. Yeah, FFL. Are they special forces? No, but they are special. We're all special. They're all, they're all fucking special. It's <laughs> tough. It's real tough. It's real tough. Um, but part of the toughness is uh, they're in the field a lot. They're fucking kept away from mainstream society. They're they don't get paid much. They they do a lot of suffering. They're living outside most a lot of times. It just you know, I'm kind of drunk. No. I'm kind of drunk. You so. don't say. Yeah. I'm kind of drunk too, but drunk. look out. You look. want to make you another one? Yeah. Okay. I'll Holy crap. Up. This is, this is, well, make I'm not going to say it's unprecedented because yeah. I think I did it last week too. Thank you very much again, Bunny. Oh my yeah. gosh. I'm just like, I'm so appreciative of you guys. This is awesome. Some stories, a few drunken rants mixed in. It is a show after all. <laughs> you know how this shit goes. When we get liquor inside, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, like I said, so Jack Mars, Jack Parsons, and L. Ron Hubbard decide that they're not only gonna. So the ritual that they uh, started doing was called Babylon working, because, like I said, Babylon was the name, not with a Y, but with an A, and that was like the name of the goddess that they were going to uh, bring to Earth, I guess. Now, also because Aleister Crowley had written this book called Moonchild in 1917. So this gave them the idea that spiritually, I, I, I guess, like mating with this Babylon goddess would produce spiritually the Moonchild. Not a real baby, like I said, but like kind of a spiritual baby. And that was the baby that was going to go to space someday or something i'm not real That's clear real strong you be careful with that okay thank you because you will get fucked up on that I'll see i'm getting her fucked up people we'll see what kind of show it is when she can barely talk <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know i'm the one that's got to read the note i can still yeah. read so I'm, I'm doing okay i think we're in the third hour uh no we're at two hours okay. and 28 minutes okay. and 14 seconds all right how much material we have left we um we halfway through but it, you know one what, third two uh thirds? it's probably like two thirds two thirds okay good 
So, like I said, so they're trying to metaphorically give birth to the moon child yeah. with the goddess Babylon. Okay. Like I said, I don't think this is an actual thing, but it's a spiritual thing. Because, like, who wants a real baby? Ew. Right. I'm just, you know what I mean? I, I feel like that was kind of where they were coming from. So... <laughs> Who wants so, a real baby? You would have <laughs> had my real baby back if we, if we had been together in the baby having years. In the baby having yeah, years. Yeah, there's a certain time where you're <laughs> young and dumb and fertile enough. To I'm where too you're old for that like, shit right now. Where you're like, yeah, I'm 25, let's have a baby. You know what I mean? Fucking, you know, but when you get into your fucking 40s and 50s, you're like, too, nah, fuck that I'm shit. too tired for that shit. Tired. I don't want to wake up for that. We have a cat. You got to... <laughs> This tastes like tequila. Is this tequila? Oh man, did I put tequila in that? Taste that. Let's that see. tastes like. Oops, that's I may my... have made you a fucking sunrise. I mean, I'll drink it. I don't care, but you know what I mean. That tastes like tequila, right? That's tequila. That's tequila. I told you. That's a tequila sunrise. Yes, it is. I grabbed it without thinking. Oh well, it'll well it'll make me drink it slower. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> Talk yeah. about me being drunk. You don't even know what liquor you're pouring. That's too. Well, they were sitting right there bottles. next to each other, and I was, you know, I just grabbed what I drank. <laughs> Put it on there. It's tequila. I wasn't here. thinking. Oh, I'm gonna have such a headache tomorrow. No, no I'm, I'm gonna like I'm gonna down no, a whole bunch of aspirin. That's silver tequila. That's real close. I mean, silver tequila is the Mexican vodka anyway. It's the Mexican vodka. He's always trying to talk me into shit. Why are you always yeah. trying to talk me into shit? That's what I do. I'm like the Joe Rogan, the fucking. <laughs> A fucking alcohol. I remember Joe Rogan trying to talk. Joe Rogan can't talk me into anything either. You should have seen him on fucking Fear Factor. You sit there and talk girls into eating fucking cave crickets and shit. Yeah, you're not talking me into you're that. Like, oh, you could do it. No, it's okay. No, it's like eating cave spiders. I'd be like, fucking, no, no. Picking up spiders no. and eating them. It's only five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars. Eat spider. Eat eat spider. Five hundred dollars. No. It's like the kind of dude that would talk your girlfriend into fucking doing porn or something. No. Fucking back when fucking Rogan was. Because thinking. that's like, seriously, that's my that's my go to answer to everything. Just no. <clears throat> not doing it and i'm seriously not eating bugs thank you very much Stop thank you very much stop propaganda topic we don't, we don't care. care about no topics i try to no stay topic. on the topic Alcohol, i was ta man i was talking about the topic when you went in Alcohol, there man. and made me a drink with tequila instead of everybody's vodka. drink is fuck saturday saturday <laughs> end of the world pandemic we can't Omega go with man man. action I'm talking you i'm talking your asses through the fucking pandemic through the apocalypse Kind of a boring apocalypse. We'll see. We'll see what happens. You know what I mean. We'll see what happens. It's all right, though. I'm going to go a nigga man on this motherfucker. <laughs> well, the thing about it is that, I mean, we worked at home anyway. Yeah. So we, we were already ready for we the transition. We were already kind of at home a lot anyway. Our weird asses couldn't get real jobs. We had to figure out fucking internet jobs. Long before everybody else. Did. I mean, well, the weird thing was, and you know, my real job is about shit. You guys don't even fucking do. <laughs> don't even worry about what I did for real. Fucking. You know what's weird though? I never really like as weird. I don't look that weird, but yeah. I mean, I used to have like you know my head shaved, and it used to be like dyed bright red and purple and stuff. I never really had that many problems finding jobs. No, it's because the way you carried yourself. Because I was good at what I did. Yeah. And plus, I was in a creative field. Mm. I was a graphic designer. So they kind of expected you to be a little weird. So yeah. it wasn't that off-putting. Right. And plus, I never really applied to jobs to like really square, like uptight kind of places. The pandemic. Um, so I never really had that much. The pandemic problem. just fucking ushered our world into reality. All right. They're all having to become like us. We were ahead of the curve a couple of years. That that's was right. only, that's in a way, it's like it sucks like that people are dying and the shit, and it's like I don't want people getting sick and everything, but in some ways it's kind of like it's just a natural part. I was working on the internet anyway. Yeah, it's and just a natural part of life. The less that I have to interact with other people, like in person, the better it is. Honestly. So I'm just kind of like see how it goes. You know, so it's all right. I, I'm not really bothered that much. I do like to go out and that's interact with people in person the but club the club is that's up. the only thing i miss honestly yeah. i don't miss going to a job i really no. don't i always hated that um but that's i do miss like going out and dancing and seeing our friends and i miss that. i'm glad i don't have bosses anymore god or commanders if i ever have to do that no again. more no oh. more you know so terrible. i'm in my own army now <laughs> 
<laughs> well, like, I'm, you know, I'm my own general. I never like ever, ever general since Tom. I was a kid. I, ever since I was a kid, I've never liked being told what to do. You know what I mean? I was just because I was always kind of like, look, I'll figure it out. Okay. Just like back off, back the fuck off. I always had pretty much, I pretty much always had good commanders. So when they I don't told want me, any command, whatever they told like me it. to do is because that would keep us alive and get to get the mission done. So I didn't Which, really, okay, cool. But that's yeah. just, you know, we're just giving you the information. Like I They're said, they're giving you the information. So you get Roger that I got, we got this. That's, you know, I'm always like, yeah, I'll figure it out. Just I didn't really like civilian on. jobs. You know, that's why I was such a good salesman, man. Fucking in, 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 in the corporate world where they just, as an independently contracted salesman, they would just go here, you sell it. You're the man. Cause I was like my own job, my own boss. Yeah. You got to go out and do your own I just, thing. Yeah. I just went out and did my own fucking thing. Which is like I said, I'm so fucking company. happy that the yeah. internet came along and I could just like, I could write my books. We could do our show. Right. You know, I can do my graphic design. I don't have to see anybody. I can just do everything like over fucking text or email. Yeah. It's fantastic. And now we're just making money, fucking disseminating information and entertainment to y'all. And among on a things. global fucking on a on a global scale, isn't that neat? Yeah, like I said, it fucking modern technology has caught up with us. So, you know, it's I know people like to like go oh, doom and gloom and everything like that, but in a lot of ways, like this is really facilitated. I mean, think how fucking cool this is. It's gonna the, work out. The pandemic sucks. I'm not saying that, but if this shit, if the what if the pandemic had happened before the internet? Think how fucking catastrophic, and it's catastrophic enough as it is, but think how catastrophic it would have been if people couldn't go to school online or work online or do all that shit. It's like it would have been way, way, way worse. Think how way think, think how catastrophic it had been if it had a 20% mortality rate. Well, and like I said, fucking, it's dead bodies to be stacked up at the end of the fucking block. Yeah, that would you be terrible. You couldn't fucking bury them fast enough. That would be terrible. The mortality rate isn't that high in this, I think. Yeah, but like I said, I was just reading an article earlier. Like they've done some studies in Europe that um, even if you just get a mild case or even an asymptomatic case, 80% um, of those that they looked at had lasting heart damage. Yeah. Which is not. I believe the shit when good. I see it. Uh, I'm just saying that was like. A, and are they talking about people in their 80s? No, they're talking I about everyone that had it. it. They're talking about. I everyone believe there's that a lot it. of weaponized information out there. I'm just saying. I'm okay. just. I'm just saying that they're yes. that they don't know because they don't know a lot about this. So they're trying to sell vaccines. A lot. Of, a lot of the a lot of the, the medical industry is involved in a lot of this. You just can't believe everything until you see it. I, I don't believe authority. This kind of authority, right? But I, like I said, I don't believe a lot of randos on. It. I don't believe a lot of randos on YouTube either. Right, but we're, I, we're randos on YouTube. Yeah, but I'm not telling you that you have to believe anything we say either, because we're just like drunk and yeah. rambling about whatever. So <clears throat> we're just a fun show. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not I trying. Know. I'm not trying to be like scientifically I've worked for accurate. Doctors that have told me fucking. You know, I can't believe mean. you made a drink with tequila. Yeah, well, whatever. I don't even like tequila. money makes the world go around. And a lot of times they tell you what's going to make them the most money, but let's get back to the show. Right. So, all right. So, so they do this shit now, apparently they, okay. So they do this ritual where they thought that they had successfully summoned the goddess. I'm not really sure if this random woman showing up that Parsons ended up marrying later was like the culmination of that. So he thought, okay, cool. It worked out or whatever, or if it was something else, but they thought that it was successful. So they were like, okay, well we can sell the mansion now, the parsonage. So they sell the mansion to developers for $25,000, which I guess was a lot of money back then. But they said under the stipulation that him and the, the new girlfriend could live in the coach house. Right. So the people that had been meeting at the lodge or whatever, they had to meet somewhere else. Cause like I said, they'd been having the meetings at this uh, mansion that Parsons had. So as I mentioned earlier, Parsons invested almost $21,000 in this quote unquote boat company with L. Ron Hubbard and his former girlfriend and former sister-in-law, <laughs> Sarah Northrop. This is messed up you guys. Um, so they were going to do this thing. And like I said, L. Ron Hubbard did purchase the yachts. I believe he bought three of them, but he had no intention evidently of, 
you know, getting Jack Parsons in on that shit, like in on the business, he was just going to take the money and take off. So that's pretty much what happened. So apparently without Jack Parsons knowing about it, L. Ron Hubbard had requested permission from the Navy to go from, uh, he was going to go to China and then he was going to go to South America and Central America. And he was basically just going around the world and just like taking off with Jack Parsons money. Yeah. So that's basically what he was doing. So they, they leave for Miami. They've got, they've got $10,000 of Jack Parsons money. Um, Jack was kind of like, what the fuck? But he calls them and Elmer was like, what? It's totally fine, man. It's like, we're not doing anything. It's like, everything is all cool. And Jack was like, okay, fine. But then, you know, they, he figured out later on that that wasn't, what it was and he and eventually ended up uh taking them to court i think he only got twenty nine hundred dollars of his money back <laughs> um which kind of sad now the thing about it is that l ron hubbard ended up marrying sarah northrop but he was already married to another woman at the time margaret grubb so that yeah. was some bigamy right there yeah so you know yeah there wasn't a big penalty for that though yeah, that's why he did it. He's they, like, "Fuck it, they catch me. What are they do? Give me a fine. Yeah. I can marry all the women. Yeah. What, what's going to happen? You can give me two weeks in jail." They, it amazes me that L. Ron Hubbard found more than one woman willing to marry that mouth. By all accounts, he was an entertaining guy. And that could, mouth, and, and he had a funny fucking mouth. I can't. That's well, see, that's the thing. Like, if it's it, kind of a slimer. You know what I mean? Like he constantly had he, spit in his mouth. Well, he definitely came across to me. And like I said, I never met the person. I never met him in person, obviously. But he always came across like in videos of him. He always just comes across like a creeper. Yeah. So, I mean, if I'd met him and I was just like, I would just be like transfixed. Yeah. By that I remember weird dude, mouth. And I'd just be like, I would just be when like. When I was a kid, time. I remember guys like that. There were lots of guys like that. It was a like I said, it was another era. It was pre-internet. If a guy could talk up a fucking storm, people people would believe it. You know what I mean? He'd get attention. So there was, the, you know, he wasn't the only one that was like that. There, there was a whole genre of dudes like that that would sit there and just fucking. I love the fact that there's like talking. types of dudes that are a genre. Yeah, it's like a genre of motherfuckers sit there and just a genre of. He would just talk his way up your slime, scar. slimy dudes slimy whose mouths look yeah. like buttholes. Yeah, <laughs> like fish he was, buttholes. He was kind the kind of. of guy that would fucking talk up a fucking big storm and maybe mesmerize you into believing that shit. You know, I mean, that's that's what he was. See, I don't think I'm mesmerizable in that fashion. You're a modern person. Yeah, it's a lot harder. You have access to information. On also, your own. I'm kind of like, you a, know, and you're skeptical about certain things. Yeah, some people want to believe certain things. And this is a time in where women got married to dudes who were the breadwinners. So they had a hard time judging who was full of shit and who wasn't. And if a guy could come along and he goes, oh, I'm going to do this and that. And she's seeing dollar signs going, he could take care of me. Well, that's what was going on in a way that's like really shitty because that's kind of like a, women back then didn't have a lot of choices. Man. Yeah. But it's like that you, you were expected to marry yeah, early, like right. at least when right. you got out of high school or when you got out of college, like in your early twenties and you needed somebody that could right. support you because you didn't really have a lot of options for supporting yourself, which was kind of sucky. Well, you all women always worked. That's another fucking thing. They always well, yeah. work. It's just that they never really became rich. Thank you. Bunyan. All right. Thank you very much. They, <laughs> I they, love attention. <laughs> they, they never really became rich. And they still, women tend to not become rich today either. All right. For, I don't know, a bunch of different factors, I guess. But if you looked at L. Ron Hubbard, he did become rich. So if you did think he was a good catch, catch you'd have been right. He swindled his way and talked his way into fucking tens of millions of dollars. So, yeah, that fucking slimy ass fucking mouth that he had. It was gold. It's just that it took time. Dude, built and an I, empire. I kind of feel like maybe some of the women that were into it were thinking to themselves, well, this guy kind of seems like a slime ball. Yeah, but other people are buying into it. But he's rich. And yeah. if he goes to prison, maybe I'll get, all his, get money. his money. There's all different kinds of angles. I mean, 
Well, like I'm I said, looking at it from, don't assume that women are dumb. They're just kind of right. like coming at it like, mm, this dude's like really irritating, but I, if uh, I could put up with him until he goes to see, jail, maybe I could get I'm his shit. I'm looking at it even before that. I'm looking at it. <laughs> I'm looking at it in the proto phases before he's had money. He's sitting there talking up a storm. A lot of women might have looked at him and went, he's full of shit. All right. But that dude's going to go far because other people believe it. Yeah, he is kind of other people are obviously other people are believing this shit. Of shit. And then he's so. fucking there was a crowd building up around him. You yeah. Know I mean, he was coming up with coming up with fucking ideas that made money that other people wanted. So they 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 you know hitched they hitched a ride on him. Well, you know? and like I said, back in the day, you kind of had to put up with what you had to put up with what you had to put up with and then you wouldn't have known much you know what i mean the fucking the mass media wasn't as developed as you have now there's no social media you couldn't go on fucking tinder you know what i mean fucking it was a different yeah. situation like i said thank fucking christ for the internet yeah. oh my god i don't even believe in that shit but thank god for the yeah. internet thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank you do i get another okay. shirt give me give me give me <laughs> what one do you want uh, like someone we'll send you another one we can do another one. We have like yeah. we have some extras. Um, Thomas Carlyle asked, "Have you guys heard of Robert Anton Wilson?" Yes, I have. Yeah. Um, he actually ended up writing about. He might be one of the main reasons why Jack Parsons kind of had a little bit of a renaissance later on because Robert Anton Wilson uh, wrote about him. Because, like I said, you know, Jack Parsons was kind of in with not only the rocket scientists, but he was also in with a lot of sci-fi writers, uh, like mm. Robert Heinlein and stuff. Yeah. So you know, he was kind of in that scene. So, it, you know, it might be in, like I said, Robert Anton. Yeah, Wilson, and here's, some here's something else. Later. We're talking about a totally different era. We remember all these names like they're legendary. If these guys were appearing today, they'd be totally unknown. These guys could not exist in the era, the modern era of social media. They wouldn't be able to compete against it. Well, there's just so, be there's so many too guys. much. Yeah. There's too much. That's and let's, what it is. let's say you had L. Ron Hubbard appear now and he's doing fucking, and he's on YouTube. He'd be laughed at. Yeah. Well, he'd be, he'd be laughed at. They go, that's a funny looking motherfucker. He'd be compared to other guys who were like him at this, at this period. And there'd be more. There'd be other guys that were better than him. He'd lose out. It just happened to be that he appeared in that place in that time. And there, the public didn't have any defenses against him. That'd be a good way to put well, it. Well, it was easier to stand out. It was easier out back then. Back then. Right. I mean, um, nowadays, you really have to do something you, you, super extreme. You've got to be on your game. Because everybody. Right. I mean, like I said, it's a double-edged sword. I mm. mean, the good thing about the internet is that it democratizes um entertainment it democratized like anybody that's creative can make their own right um you know content and that's awesome right. but you got to compete but it's also else. much harder yeah. to kind of you know make yourself stand out from the fray you well, know yeah, I mean? thank you thank you bro bunny punter oh my god you are a champion you were a champion send, this us a, send jenny a private message in extra the large <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I have I have their address okay, because okay. yeah, because he was the one the ones that we sent what the shirt model to before. Um, yeah, like what? Because I think I sent you, I sent you a logo one like this one, and I also I think I might have also sent him a Bliskin one. Okay, but we can do. Uh, I have a, a Wayland, Wayland Industry, one. and I have a fucking. Uh, I have this one. I'm gonna which make is Wayland Utani. I'm going to make. A Tyrell one. Okay, yeah. Even though, like I said, Tyrell industry. we had the idea to do the Tyrell one with the owl yeah. and everything, even though a bunch of other people have done a design like that, but I think I can maybe do okay. it, a better one All right. than the ones that I've seen. All right. I mean, not to be snotty or anything. Yeah. I mean, some of the ones that I've seen are nice, but I could probably do it. Okay. Than that. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, all right. So right about the time of uh, the Cold War, you know, emerging, got your Red Scare kind of shit. You get it's your like Wayland Industries. Yeah, okay. I got a Wayland one. We have two of those. It's we like have... this. It's the same size we have as this. That... Says Wayland. Yeah, we have a Wayland, Wayland one that just says Wayland Corporation, and one yeah. that has says Wayland Utani. Yeah. So um, yeah, so you have your House Un-American Activities Committee. So 
they're starting to investigate people that have perceived communist sympathies and uh, Jack Parsons comes up on their radar. Like I said, I believe the FBI had been watching Jack Parsons since the 1940s. He certainly believed that they were watching him. And I really don't have any reason to doubt it because they thought, because Aleister Crowley was being watched, they definitely thought that um, Aleister Crowley's group was subversive. And um, because they were into free love, they were into women's equality, they were into other things. So it's like they were kind of watching them as well because they thought they were a degenerate influence. So because he was involved with them, they, he started, uh, they started watching him as well. Take a break. Hold on, baby. So um, at this point, they kind of like ramped up, I guess, their uh, surveillance of him. And he ended up uh, losing, like a lot of his uh, colleagues that he had worked with previously ended up losing their security clearances and their jobs. Um, and also, this was very weird to me. I guess this wouldn't happen nowadays. But in the FBI's file of Jack Parsons, they actually listed him as quote unquote possibly bisexual, which is like a weird thing to like, think that the FBI would like in this day and age, it seems very strange that the FBI would like put that in their fucking shit about you. But I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that he was particularly bisexual. I think there was one dude that said that, yeah, we had like a, you know, a homosexual relationship like back in the whenever, but honestly he was seen as more of like a womanizer and you know, like his dad was. And he kind of like got into like was into orgies and he was like super into women and stuff. So I don't really know. Like he may have been bisexual. I don't really know. But it's just very weird to me that the FBI would like put that in their fucking report about him. I don't know. Different era. Like I said, thank you very much, Janet. Oh my goodness. Thank you very much. Oh, that's so awesome. I love that little cartoon. Is he an avocado? He's an avocado. So, yeah, so they accuse him of, like, quote-unquote sexual perversion because of his affiliation with the OTO and Aleister, Aleister Crowley. So, and like I said, they're all getting their security clearances revoked, um, you know, because of their association with Aleister Crowley, because of their association with leftist politics, um, which was a big no-no at the time. Um it and it seems like Jack Parsons, he had written some, he had done some political writings later on. I don't believe that they were published until after uh, he died. But I mean, he was not a communist. I mean, he was very, uh, he he was uh, had some Marxist ideas. He had some socialist ideas. He was very um, morally opposed to Nazis. I mean, one of the reasons that he was getting into rocketry and getting into all that stuff was specifically to fight against the Nazis. And, um, you know, one of his colleagues particularly was like, you know, let's <coughs> fucking kill these fascists. Let's do this that, and the other. So they were very into that, but it does seem like he kind of, you know, as much as he kind of flirted with communist ideas earlier on, he really didn't go all in with that. Um, even though the FBI did still perceive him as being a danger, I guess. So now, hold on. before you go on too much about the FBI, let me just say on a side note, later on, L. Ron Hubbard and the Church of Scientology, Scientology launched something called Operation Snow White, I believe it was, what it was called. Yes, it was. Which was that. the la largest infiltration of the FBI in fucking history. It was, as far Scient as I know, it still is. Yeah, Scientology is. infiltrated FBI to find, to find out all their fucking secrets. Yep. But what the weird, what really, they wanted to know the secrets about Scientology. It was because LRH was so paranoid about the FBI, he wanted to know what they knew about him. Weird. Weird. Yeah. Snow White, Operation Snow White. But went down in history. So even though these guys are kind of fucking misfits, they got shit done. It's weird. It's really weird. Yeah. That's quite, it takes quite a bit of power to infiltrate the FBI. Just keep sending that people at him. Just keep sending people at him to fucking get jobs. 
Eventually, they get jobs at the FBI and find out anything. That's what's weird. Those FBI agents were loyal to fucking Scientology, not the FBI. Weird. Yeah, story. I mean, I kind of feel like. I don't know. I think people have a perception. You have a perception that like the FBI or the government or whatever, that it's like this one big, you know, monolithic structure, but it's not, it's just like a bunch of offices, which are like yeah. regular fucking people, just like every other <clears throat> like workplace. So I feel like, you know, there's a lot of, maybe this upsets some people, but there's like a lot of gaps there where if you can pretend good enough, you can just get a job there like a regular yeah. person and if you had nefarious intent, yeah, you could totally just get in there and be like, "Yeah, I just want a job here." Yeah, they passed that security and background then, check, though. Well, yeah, but it's like if you hadn't done anything like yeah. in your previous life. Nobody. Yeah, it's weird. The, the it's weird that their relatives didn't mention that they were part of the Church of Scientology. Maybe they, they got go, everybody to like fucking go because they usually that. go ask. They usually go fucking interview everybody who knows you and everybody who's related to you. Yeah. But, you know, like I said, maybe nobody knew or yeah. maybe they got people to lie for them or hmm. I don't think it's as hard as people think. I mean, if you can get a few people to like fucking say I think some it would be shit, harder today. I just do. Uh, well, nowadays, yeah. yeah, because nowadays, you know, they can check everything. They can check every fucking Facebook post you yeah. ever made. Every everything. So yeah. back then, much harder. They could just go to Google and fucking buy all your information and everything about you. Yeah. Know they could what just, porn you were watching. Right. What porn you were watching, everything yeah. you ever bought off Amazon. Yeah. So it's like, you know, back then it was much easier to get yeah. away with shit. <laughs> Nowadays, yeah. I don't think you could. Nowadays, you make one fucking bad tweet and everybody knows about that shit. So, yeah. So at this point, so like I said, um, you know, he's getting in trouble with the FBI. A bunch of his like former colleagues are getting like blackballed. Um, because of their political beliefs, because of their, um, you know, former situation, you know, with quote unquote sexual degenerates or whatever, because they were hanging out with Aleister Crowley. So at this point, like uh, the relationship between Jack Parsons and his uh, then wife became kind of strained. Um, she kind of like moved away to like some artist commune in Mexico or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's right. They infiltrated the IRS as well. You're right. Yeah, I think that was Operation Snow White was infiltrating the IRS was because the IRS? the IRS was going to audit them. Yeah. So they got a couple people they like up, at low level jobs right. in there that kind of like worked their way out. They ended up bringing the IRS to their knees too about uh fucking re what is it good? Because re religious taxation. Remember yeah. that shit? They didn't want the they, and they you know wanted what sucks religious status. So they, they eventually won. They, they eventually won. won. They, that's what I'm saying. They brought they brought the. IRS they don't have to pay name. taxes on no. all of the fucking properties that they own because yeah. now Scientology is officially seen a as a religion. Religious exemption, I think, is what it's called. Which is bullshit. Well, yeah. I, actually, I think all and of they that bullied their way into that. All of religious exemption is bullshit. That should not be yeah. allowed. I mean, seriously, look at all the fucking property that religions own. It's a real estate scam. That's what I mean. Don't that should I'm not saying, be. Bye, Thomas. I don't know who you are. Why are you by? What are you? What's it? You pretty? Yeah. Okay. Bye. See you. What? Uh, <laughs> what are you talking? Somebody about? saying goodbye. Okay. Bye. Uh, I know we've been on for so long. Yeah. We've been, well, we've been going for three hours. That's good. But yeah. we're almost done. Hour three. Almost done. All yeah. Right. So all right. So at this point, like his wife has taken off. Mm -hmm. Um, he's been blackballed from working in rocketry. So Jack Parsons decided he's going to go like full on back into occultism, back into his sex magic thing. So he starts recruiting uh, sex workers for that purpose. Um, he's basically what he wants to do. He wants to do a ritual called the crossing of the abyss, which I guess is attaining union with the universal consciousness like you're trying to do. Yeah. So, he says that he succeeded in doing that, which was there any proof of that? No. Yeah. But you know what I mean? That's the nice thing about this new agey kind of shit. You don't it's need just any like proof. you don't need any proof. You can just say, I was gonna do this. Yeah, I totally yeah, I did that. Like shit. This. Yeah. 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 And everyone just has to believe you, right. apparently. So so he said that he did that. So then he says that he had an out-of-body experience that was invoked by 
Babylon, the goddess that he had supposedly invoked. And then he was astrally projected back to a biblical city called Chorazin. Chorazin? Uh, something. Sounds like something about Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chorazin. Like, he's yeah. just making this up. Yeah. I'm just saying. He called this the Black Pilgrimage. Okay. Um, yeah, so he said, okay, I was, like I said, I'm not into all this new agey shit. So every says, so, so excuse me if I <laughs> sound a little skeptical, dubious yeah. of all this stuff. So apparently, so he goes back to this biblical city. He says that he embodied this spirit or this entity or whatever, who is called Valerian Armillus Al- Dijal. Now, who's saying this? Jack Parsons. Okay. Um, who was also the Antichrist? Yeah. For some reason. Okay, no, yeah, because, yeah. of course. This sounds like he's been hanging out with L LRH with all this fucking scient Scientology writing, like Balerian and Coruscant. This is all from science fiction movies that came later. That's what I mean. Just maybe like, they make, just maybe those it. writers were fucking listening to all this shit. Like I said, I love, I love fiction as much as the next person. But you have yeah. to maintain. You can't like believe that shit's true, man. LRH is stand up there on the fucking deck of the free winds with all these fucking young fucking cabin girls fucking listening to him at his feet. He's pointing up at the stars at night, telling them what the fuck was happening on fucking distant planets on other galaxies and shit, and where all the empires were. And they said he could go on for hours like that. And they would sit there, they'd just eat that shit up, telling the whole Star Wars story. How did they not fall asleep? No, they loved it. It's another era. I guess. Yeah. They didn't like have a lot of other entertainment options back then. Not, yeah. <laughs> sit around and listen to LRH. I'm going to sit around on a boat and listen to some weird anus mouthed man Talk tell about me about what's happening on other planets. Xenu yeah. and some other shit happening yeah. on other planets. Yeah. Whereas at one point I'd be like, <laughs> evidently they loved it. Can I go read or can I get to go? Well, they joined the else? cult, man. They joined the I cult guess. for a reason. That's the way they were. I don't they know. They loved man. that shit. Imagine if you like Star Wars and the fucking George Lucas had a cult and all you did is sit around and listen to George Lucas tell you about Star Wars. Look, you I fucking like, love that shit. Look, I love Star Wars, but, okay? Yeah. But not that much. Damn. <laughs> You're not, not a real fan. Not so much that You're I would like fan. listen to some yeah. old man like talk yeah. about it. Like it was real. That's what you were dealing with, though. Then. That's what I mean. What I don't get with. that. I don't time. get that. It was another time. Don't you have anything better to do? No, they Do didn't. They didn't have fucking. Not. They didn't have little fucking laptop computers and Jesus little cell phones and shit like that. I have like a million other even, things I'd have to do. Didn't even see images that much, you know, except the movies, maybe it's TV, but the imagery sucks. So everything was imagination. I get everything it. was imagination. <laughs> Alex says, did, did Jenny just say anus mouth man? Yes, Indeed I did. did. Yeah, yeah. It's like an anus with teeth. Kind of like that ass judge from fucking The Wall. Remember the movie, the Pink Floyd, yeah. The Wall movie? That it's like a butthole, judge, but with like teeth in it. Like a mouth. To fucking, yeah. He had a fucked up mouth. That's what Elrond Hubbard And then Hubbard's. later his teeth got fucked up. They were green. That's shit. what his mouth reminds me of. He had green teeth. Eventually kind of like a up. lamprey, but also yeah. like a butt, like a prolapsed butthole, but yeah. with teeth in it. <laughs> and like when he talked, yeah. like, because I've seen videos of him up. talking and it's like, his lips are always like coming like, out in this really like was, unsettling it fashion. Like, it was kind of like, he was kind of like fucking Dennis in this world. Well, you have to understand, or Zeno, and the, maybe the, that's the, what it is. Ground. Maybe that's why, yeah. because the intergalactic yeah. warlords would all come and descend upon us because you know this, because there's so many the intergalactic, you know, fucking universal law enforcement. You know, that's which what as soon about. as yeah, somebody yeah. starts, I'm just like, bye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, bye. they were all imprisoned in a big fucking right volcano, now. and then they sealed it with atomic bombs and. All the Thetans came out in the, in, in millions of years ago, and we evolved here, and they're all inside of us now. And that was, right. yeah, and that's real enough. Scientology. It's exactly what it is. Fair Alien enough. demonic possession is exactly what he's talking Michael about. Michael Schaefer says, isn't that like the movie Dreamcatcher? Probably. I was, You know what? I couldn't bring myself... I read the book. <clears throat> I hated the book so much. Look, look, I love Stephen King, okay? I'm, I'm just saying that right now. But I read the book Dreamcatcher... And I remember, I liked the book. It was okay. But I remember reading it. And when I finished it, I said, please, God, that I do not believe in, please do not let anybody make a movie out of this. And they did. 
they made a movie out of it. And from what I can discern, because I'm not going to sit through it, um, it was just as terrible as I imagined. I never saw that an adaptation of that book would be like, look, this is a prime example of shit that works relatively well on the page does not work in a movie. Uh, no one wants to see ass weasels. Ass weasels. In a movie. There were ass weasels in the fucking book? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You see, my last Stephen King book was Tommy Knockers. I read that. Wow, shit. that was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, I didn't I, like that book. I, yeah, I read that and I was like, this fucking book kind of I'm not sucks. super into and aliens, that was, that though, was, as villains. I'm that just, was the end of That's Stephen, just me. That was the end of my Stephen King period. I think, I well, like the newest one that I read of his was Dr. Sleep, which I actually yeah. liked. Um, I didn't love it. Um, and prior to that, I think the newest one that I had read was Under the Dome, okay. which I actually really liked, but I promptly forgot about it after yeah. I read it. I kind of feel like I love Stephen King, like I said, but I feel like his, his most memorable shit was a long time ago. Shit from the seventies and eighties yeah. and maybe nineties. Um, the newest stuff is good, but it doesn't really like stick with you. Just like directors. They have a half life. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't stick with you. Yeah. It's it's not that it's bad. It's just that it's not like super yeah, memorable. I couldn't give a shit about a lot of the old directors, even how great they were back in the day. But you watch them now, and fucking, I'm just like, nah, they don't carry any water. Anymore. I mean, I might even in fucking Cameron. I'm like, man, fuck you. But uh, look, look, we're getting sidetracked. We gotta fucking finish. We gotta. What finish else is new? Yeah, I mean, I might it. review some of his newer books, like yeah. on my you know new book review show that I'm doing. Yeah. But I don't know. I I might or I might not because. Directors and writers, they age and not necessarily like a fine wine. They have and, to be young. And on yeah, and honestly, like um on the new book review show that I'm doing, I'm gonna do like some older uh shit like Peter Straub and uh maybe Clive Barker and I'm gonna do House of Leaves and stuff like that. But it's like I'm kind of more interested in exploring like newer horror fiction because there's a lot of um new horror writers out nowadays that I haven't read a lot of their stuff and I really wanna get back into it to see what's kind of going on in, you know, the present day. So it'll probably lean more toward that, but you know, we'll see how it goes. So, all right. So at this stage, um, so Jack Parsons, he thinks that, uh, you know, within a few years that Babylon, the goddess, the goddess is going to manifest on earth and supersede the dominance of the Abrahamic religions right which remember when that happened well they were trying to get rid of them because they stood in the way of their their new religious fucking ideas that they were coming up with all yeah. these guys which like i said they that was religions they had to go they that was kind of like i get that like because yeah. that was like a big thing at the time you know right. the the real they they seemed like very repressive very yeah. backwards like i get that um and you saw that a lot during the 60s like people looking for other you know, uh, you well, know, spiritual like, path. I like I Scientology's answer to the Abrahamic religions. They were all just a hallucination from Thetans. Thetans gave you these hallucinations. They're not real. Only Scientology is real. Which, but anytime yeah. anybody tells you that, yeah, <laughs> that is also they're bullshit. just hallucinations. That is also bullshit. They're just hallucinations. Because that's like, honestly, that's kind of one of the if you're gonna like propagandize, yeah. particularly in a religious sense. Yeah. One of the first things you do is demonize all your competing belief yeah. systems. Yeah. That's one of the first things that you do. Yeah. I mean, that is propaganda 101. Yep. Yeah. Propaganda 101. So, uh, around this time period, Jack Parsons also wrote uh, an essay on his politics and his individual philosophy. Um, he was kind of like liberal leaning toward libertarianism. He was very against um, government interference in anyone's private lives, particularly their sexual lives. Like I said, he was very into uh, women's equality. He was very into, um, I don't know if he specifically said, uh, you know, decriminalization of homosexuality, bisexuality, but he was very into that type of thing where there shouldn't be any laws like regulating like people's sexuality, like whether they have sex outside of marriage or whether they have sex with people of the same sex or whatever, it shouldn't be any yeah, business. Yeah, it was preventing orgies. Right, yeah. <laughs> so, he, so he was very against that type of shit. So like I said, this is 1940s. He so. wants to have all this girl-on-girl -girl action during the threesomes and shit. Fucking, he wants to fucking get 
all ages. It was fucking full spectrum sexuality. That's what that's what this well, is yeah. all about. Yeah. 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 So um, so he wrote all this stuff, although um, a lot of it actually wasn't published until uh, after he died. Now, apparently, this is one thing when I was reading about him that kind of, I don't know why this like struck me, but apparently L. Ron Hubbard had written a letter to Jack Parsons telling, asking him if he would take Sarah yeah. back. Yeah, take her back and get her the fuck out of here. <laughs> Which at that point, L. Ron Hubbard had stolen her yeah. from Jack He's Parsons. He's trying to give to her back. Like, and then married her. Yeah. And it was like, hey, want her back? Yeah. Because I'm kind of like over it. Apparently. It was well, kind you, of you know what? Like this that. is kind of clicking with me. Because <laughs> with what I know of Scientology, he started having problems with her eventually. Having to do with fucking money and stuff. So that's probably what he's trying to do. He's trying to get rid of her. He's trying to get rid of her because of the fucking money. And he, there was a new woman he was trying to fucking pick up too. Well, kind of always. Like right. like I said, he was very into it had, it had to do with who owned what and he I think he had some of her money and he was trying to get rid of it was complicated. LRH rose to power by scamming people. Yeah. Fucking, and, big time. Uh, but scamming people works. If you look at the dudes that become fucking rich and powerful they always start off as two bit fucking hucksters and scabbers. They scam their way into that shit. Most you got to be time. real good at this shit, though. Yeah. Yeah. And they fuck over a lot of people. That's how they get to there. I mean, you and have to. Once like... they get to a certain amount of money, now they have something to work with. But when they're being born, so to speak, they're fucking predators. Well, they're not even predators. There's a certain amount of honor to being a predator, they're fucking parasites. That's what they really That's are. That's a better word. They're fucking parasites, yeah. And like I said, you can say, I don't know, this is a very like fine line to walk because when you look at people like, like look at your fucking um, like televangelists, let's say, like from the 80s. You can say, yes, those people are hucksters. Yes, they are exploiting a vulnerable population. You can also say, you know, people should be more savvy. People should not fall for that kind of shit. I mean, but it, to me, that seems a little bit like victim blaming. It, I do feel like people like, you know, your televangelists in the 80s that were basically telling people, like, I used to watch this dude, like, I used to hate watch this dude named uh, Robert Tilton. And familiar. yeah, his big thing, like, he was like the smarmiest motherfucker ever. And like, yeah. his big thing was, quote unquote, give out of your need. Yeah. You don't have any money. Yeah. But send me money and you then you and back. then God will reward you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And like it kind yeah, of like I was really conflicted about it because it's like, look, it makes me really sad that like maybe some 90 year old grandma someone yeah. will fall for that. But also why would like don't be so dumb like why are you setting this fucking I remember when shit I, bird your money i remember when all that was going on i'd watch it's fucking I, I, crazy I would, I would, it's I would, crazy I would, I would watch that shit for a few minutes and then just flip through it i would find it really amusing but you had to ask myself hey, you have to ask yourself yeah you could look at it the two ways you were talking about but you could also look at it another way was he was he offering something that was like a service to those people? Was he making them feel better like they were going to go to heaven? And I think in some ways they were. That's what of, I mean. It's like uh, you can't. It's, it's hard to tell. Right. Because a lot of it has to do with emotion. And yet you don't know the, the situation. It could be that somebody's just terminally ill. They're going to die. They want to go to heaven. They want to feel good. So they think, well, if I send him some money, he'll do something good with it. And I can die and go to heaven. I'll feel good about myself. That's why I'm and conflicted. I think a lot of it has. To, I That's think a lot conflicted. of it was that. Because it's because like healthy, normal people weren't sending that motherfucker money. I hope not. No. No. If you are, if you it are, was always it. somebody who is at the fucking, like I said, I don't want to say bottom of the barrel, but at the bottom of the food chain. It was always somebody at the bottom of the food chain. But I think, I think they got gratification from it. In the same way, I think it was exactly the same thing as that home shopping network where you had people that are in, living in trailer parks. I think a lot of them were mentally ill buying fucking trinkets 
over the phone. Well, they would call up would and, call they would up and they would get on attention. the show. And they would get attention. And the woman and like the, right. the host would talk to them. And they would buy some fucking worthless piece of fucking right. costume jewelry for fucking a hundred dollars or something. But they got to grandstand for a few minutes and, and they had the show. They got to talk to them. They got, they got like a human so, connection. You know, me being an ex salesman, that's a transaction. Yeah. It's almost like a form of prostitution. Going to a fucking hooker to get some attention. Yeah. And then it's over. Yeah, money was changed hands, but if without that, nothing would have happened for you. Yeah. You'd have been sitting there. And I think it was that same thing. To is it taking advantage of people or is it offering a service? It's very difficult. That's what I mean. Tell. It's like that's why I'm conflicted about it. Because in some ways, it's like, yes, they are taking advantage of a vulnerable population. Yeah. But, but they're also, also kind of offering something. those people are adults. Yeah. I mean, unless they have like mental issues, and which is, obviously that's a different thing. But it's like, are they getting something out of it that's worth it are. to I them? They, I think they are. Right. And and it did. It would not surprise me if you were to go back through the records of those televangelists and see that it's it's not one that it's regular customers over and over again. I'm sure it is. I'm sure they're it is. getting the gratification out of it somehow. That they're, that they're, I mean, to me, like me watching it, like hate watching it, yeah. I was just kind of like, why the fuck would anybody, because it seemed like so obvious to me that this dude was just like, yeah, send me your fucking money, you stupid, <laughs> you know, you, know, not what you stupid saying, rube. That's but that, well, that's saying. how I was interpreting it right. because that's how it sounded to me. If that you're he looking was, at it through the looking at it through your rational eyes. Well, obviously, you're not looking at it through the eyes of the right. person that's fucking doing it. Right, right, right. And they're seeing this guy as an ambassador to God and heaven, and they're going to die, and they're going to heaven. It's it's a very different dynamic, and there's a certain I'm convinced because I've seen the old ladies that were doing that kind of shit. They were into that. I know the type. They had them all over Mississippi, living in fucking trailers. All right. They were magical thinkers. Yeah. All right. So I understand why they're doing it. Uh, and, I understand and, and, it too. And, 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 here's just, another, and you know. I don't believe that they actually 100% believed it either. Like I, I, in the back of their mind, they knew that they were getting gratification from it. And that they, and I think there was the, the doubt that, yeah, I like doing it because I'm a part of something. You know what I mean? I'm going to give them, they're trying to help. Yeah. Basically, basically what they're trying to do. Yeah. They're helping that dude. I mean, you know what I mean? They're helping him. That's all they're And doing. that's all they're helping, really. But he had a whole organization. Why are we sidetracked? We're fucking sidetracked again. We're talking about televangelists. How do you do that to me? Sidetrack me that it me? is it is an interesting topic. We ought to get into those motherfuckers eventually. I honestly have had like televangelists and stuff on my list for like yeah. a really long time. And to, to you foreign listeners, they don't exist anymore. That's gone. That era is gone. I don't but, think but, so. Uh, I mean, f uh, like several years ago, I know yeah. there were a few channels like... like They would um, be on YouTube. They wouldn't be on television if they existed. I don't know, man, because old people still watch TV. Maybe. We have I to think check. there we are a couple check. of channels. We like, I don't check. know because I don't watch TV, but it's check. like, I mean, there might be some channels. I think I mean, gone. several, like... 10 years ago, there were still channels that were dedicated to that. Yeah. But I don't know about I, that. You know, that. It's not like I Even look. back in the 80s when I was a kid, to me, it was obvious that it was a show. Yeah. It was obvious that it was a show. It was obvious to me that these dudes had a rock star type fucking persona to them. When all that fucking shit about them with the Tammy Faye and the fucking chick with the big old titties and shit. What was her name? The one that ended up in the house. The she, she ended up being in she Jessica up, Hahn. Jessica Hahn. Yeah. Yeah. She ended up being. Why in, do I remember she that? She ended up being know. in porn. Okay. She did. Yeah. And um, well, what else? Doing lesbian do? shit. But what to me, that was not even shocking. I was like, well, of course, that's what that was. It's obvious to me what that that's what that was. Yeah. Well, that's, that that was. You know, that's so I don't understand why people were shocked. Well, see, like, that's what well, I'm. That's what that was, and it's what it always was. That's what I'm saying is that. Coming from somebody, even when I was even growing up in the 80s when I was a teenager. Yeah, I knew exactly I would watch that. that shit and I'd yeah. be like, that's obviously yeah. hucksters. Yeah. And the fact that anyone would take that seriously, or the yeah. fact that anyone would be surprised when, for example, 
like one of them would come out and it's like, oh, they had a stash of child porn or one of them yeah, would come yeah. out and like they would do porn later. It's like, why would anybody be shocked by that? To That's me, like, I don't know why anybody would be shocked by that. To me, as a young guy coming out of a fucking heavy metal background, I instantly fucking recognize that as a fucking rock concert for old ladies. Yeah. That you have a guy up there and maybe a fucking older woman that they can identify with putting on a show. That they're both sex symbols. That they're both fucking making money and giving entertainment. I yeah. obviously understood what that was. And then the fact you got Jessica Hahn and fucking all this. Like, of course that shit would be going on. Of course. That's what it was. Can I just it's tell rock, you? Rock. Can I just tell metal. you right now? Religious heavy metal. If I without ever. Without music. If I ever end up going in that way, in that old lady direction, if I'm was, watching like yeah. televangelists and, and like uh, home shopping, it won't please, happen anymore. Please shoot me. It won't happen. Please. It won't happen anymore. It was I'm only that generation, and they're dead now. I hope so. That was my, oh my god. It was, it was seriously. That if was that happens to me, you will know no. that I have lost my fucking mind. <laughs> that was my, that was my grandmother's generation. Yeah, they're they're all dead now. You know, if there's some out there that's very few of them. Look at Zach. What's Zach saying? Hey, guys, I just got home from work. How much of the show did I miss? I um, missed all the fucking Almost show. three and a half hours. You missed the blobfish. You missed all the porn. You missed yeah. all kind of L. Ron Hubbard, Scientology. You missed all that stuff. Tammy Stumbo is saying that they're on TV and her mother-in-law loves them. I told you that still that shit. That must be some weird still shit because that was most that was some shit out of my grandmother's generation. Old people still watch TV. We don't. They have to know that that shit's fake. I mean, I'm old too. Shit, dude, I'm almost fifty. You're, well, I'm, you're 50, 50. I'm fifty-one. One. I would have been old a long time ago. <laughs> Bet when you only live to be about fifty. I still got another. You'd 20, be dead by now. I'd be dead by now. I got another twenty-five I probably years left. Be too, and I will be fucking artificially pickled and fucking <laughs> preserved in tequila, in tequila and sarms, <laughs> and fucking anabolic steroids, keeping me. I'll be like Jack Lane, ninety-six years old. I'm hoping that all the alcohol will pickle yeah. me. I'm kind of hoping yeah. that. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm almost like I'll be forty-eight in September, and I'm kind of hoping. That I'll kind Tammy of says that she's in her 70s. Yeah, that makes a little bit more sense. That's my mother's generation. They might be a little bit susceptible. To me, I I don't think they even 100 percent take it seriously. I think they I think they know it's entertainment, and they're just trying to be a part of a crowd that believes in something, and they're trying to do something. It's I think it's more of a substitute for a, a, a scene. You know what I mean? It's like like a. And I think it was kind of like that back then because it yeah. was it was old women in their seventies. Everybody houses. wants to join something. Why do they want to do that? In in, in Mississippi, it was older women in their seventies that were into that shit back in the Tammy Faye era. Yeah, I know. And they were living by themselves. Their husbands were dead, and they'd watch that shit. And it was just like a big singing along, like a happy clappy. And they'd send some money because they wanted to see the show again, but they didn't. And I. I don't think they realized that it was a fuck fest behind the scenes and that they had helicopters and whole fucking huge compounds that the motherfuckers owned small towns. You know what I mean? The fucking huge comp religious compounds, you know, with big titty fucking secretaries with it. that were ready to shoot porn. I don't think they thought that, but to me, I was, I was, I was thinking that that's exactly what it was. Well, because it came out, I was like, here's the thing. All these televangelists, particularly, and like I said, we need to do a whole show on this. Yeah, we need to do a show. I could, time. I could go on for hours, but n honestly, the shit that people go on the most about, like, or they condemn the most—that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing because yeah. that's projection. It's that's projection. Because I mean, look at like the—I can't remember the dude's name. John, what was his name? John Tanner. He was some kind of like um, government dude in Florida back in the eighties or nineties. And all he was doing was just hammering on porn, 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 porn. And I was sitting there going that dude, they're going to find that his house is full of porn. Guess what? His yeah. house was full of porn. Oh yeah. Because why the fuck would you care? Otherwise it's just kind of like all these dudes that go on about, Oh, the gays and Oh, this, that, and the That's other. Always a gay dude. It's always somebody yeah. that, has had, or it's not necessarily a gay dude, but it's somebody that's had gay feelings and ashamed of it or some yeah. shit like that. It's always something like that because otherwise, why would you care what other people are doing 
they're focusing in on what why would you care it's like i don't care what other people are doing their we're getting sidetracked that's what i'm saying it's none of my business we're getting sidetracked so it's like the fact that they're so focused on it means that they must have some personal stake in that they're focused in on it because they're focused on it right yeah so yeah I'm just saying that's what I'm not saying that everybody that is like they cut a lot of those anti gay is yeah. gay, but I'm just saying that they may have had like a crush on a dude and like they're ashamed about it and they can't deal with it. Uh, and so uh, and the televangelists that I remembered that got busted were with fucking dudes. Yeah. I'm just saying that's yeah. not always the case, yeah. but you know what I mean? That's, that's usually out, I remember two or three of those going down because that's like a big in hotel room. With that's a fucking, big thing that you do when yeah. you repress your own yeah. feelings, you tend to project onto others like your own shame. You project it onto other people. And I think they don't realize that it's very obvious to other people that that's exactly What's what they're Pook? doing. What's up? Oh, Pookie came in the door. Creeped. Okay, so for a while, so Jack Parsons works for, uh, I believe, Howard Hughes Aviation Company for yeah. a time. So, but he gets fired from there because, company. yeah, because of all the FBI uh, yeah. attention around him because of his activities. Um, so what they thought that he was doing, which I don't think there was really any evidence for, but he had taken some of the... Um, like it, it wasn't like real sensitive material or anything, but he had taken some documents from there and he'd copied them and he sent them like overseas because he was trying to get a job in Israel because he'd been blackballed in the US. There's Pookie. Mm -hmm. She's going to be on the show for a second until she's be like, fuck off. So um, because he'd been blackballed from working in uh, rocketry, jet propulsion, whatever you want to call it, in the U.S., so he was looking for a job overseas uh, in that field. So he was going to move to Israel and work in Israel. So he was, like, copying some of the documents, like, to go along with his resume. And one of the secretaries at the company, like, I guess saw him doing that or knew that he did that and narked on him. And so the FBI like kind of swooped in and investigated him again for being a spy for the Israeli government. But they kind of like, they did like some investigations and they found that they didn't, there wasn't really any cause for that. And even the shit that he copied wasn't like secretive material or anything. Um, it was just him being dumb and not really thinking about the optics of it. Um, but you know, they still did consider him a liability because like I said, he'd once like been a Marxist and blah, blah, blah. So he still gets a ban uh, in 1952 uh, from working on classified projects. So he gets, um, so what he does, he basically has to start his own company at this point because he's been blackballed from working in the industry. He starts his own company called the Parsons Chemical Manufacturing Company based in North Hollywood. And what that was doing was he was working on explosives, pyrotechnics, fog effects, stuff like that for the film industry. So he was started working on the movies because they wouldn't let him work on rockets anymore because of whatever. So what ends up happening at this point? Like, so he, he's running that business. He also has a home lab, uh, which he's, you know, established in his house, like in the laundry room, which he's working on his chemical stuff. He also is making homebrew absinthe. Nice. Um, he also like started renting out like some of the, you know, rooms in his house and stuff like to make extra money. So what he also started like another Thelema group, which he called the witchcraft. So he was still into that as well. Um, so apparently he gets a job working on, um, a Hollywood film, like a film set that was going to be like an explosion. So this is in June of 1952 and he gets, uh, the job and it's like a rush. They're like, look, we need these like explosive special effects. We need you to do it like right away because we're really behind. So he starts working on it in his home lab. And for whatever reason, um, he, blew himself up <laughs> okay that's about the only way that we can say it so it the explosion like destroyed the lower part of his house um 
basically his right forearm was blown off. Damn. Half of his face was torn off. Um, and you know what I mean? Like, so, and like he had broken arms, broken legs. It's like, it just blew him the fuck up. Damn. He looked like Davros from fucking the Doctor Who. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, yeah. like fucking Anakin Skywalker. Yeah. Something like that. Like he got all his shit blown off. Now this, the fucked up thing is that when they found him, he was still conscious. Yeah. Like he could still talk and stuff. So he tries to like, so the ambulance comes and he's trying to still talk to them and shit. And, you know, the, he couldn't really say anything coherent. I mean, obviously. So they take him to the hospital. A uh, little more than half an hour later, he's pronounced dead. Okay. 37 years old. Damn. Died young. He did. Now, okay. there are a lot of shitty things about this. Okay. The first shitty thing about this is that as soon as he died as soon as his mom heard about him dying she took an overdose and killed herself damn so try to do that on purpose or by accident uh on purpose okay yeah it was a suicide now okay now probably his death was ruled an accident like he was mixing up some chemicals to do an explosion for a movie set. And people are like, Oh, he was mixing up stuff in a coffee can and it slipped out of his hand. They dropped it and it mixed with some other shit that was on the floor or like whatever. And it blew the shit up. Now that's the official story. Um, not crazy because a lot of his friends said, yeah, he was real clumsy. He wasn't super careful. Like his hands were always sweaty. So he could have like just dropped the can. Some of his other friends have speculated that because this was very early in the Cold War, he was very inconvenient. I mean, he'd been someone that was kind of on the forefront of, you know, rocketry of like starting the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And he was inconvenient in the sense that he was kind of a leftist. He was kind of he was into the occult and he was a little bit, quote unquote, embarrassing so it would have been to the government's benefit to have him disappear. So some people have said that perhaps this was murder. Sounds very far fetched. I to don't me. know if I buy that. Um, I do. It. I kind of feel like maybe it was maybe an accident. Some people said, "Oh, probably wasn't an accident because he was really good at mixing chemicals." Blah blah blah. But even people that are really good at mixing chemicals can still make a mistake or they can still drop something or well, something. Well, just working on a movie, probably wasn't taking it too seriously. And some people have yeah. said, too, that it might have been suicide, that it might have been deliberate suicide. Mm -hmm. Because he had been having problems with depression prior to. He'd been going through a lot of shit. Like, the FBI was watching him. He'd uh, lost his wife. He lost his job. So there was like a lot of sh bad shit that was going on in his life. So it could have been either one or the other. Do I think that he was deliberately murdered? I doubt it. I mean, it does seem weird, like the timing of it, but I don't think that's enough evidence to say because it could have been an accident or it could have been deliberately suicide. I if think he, those are more likely. If you ask me, he thought the work was beneath him. He wasn't taking it fucking too seriously. Yeah, he might have been, and, and he might have been rushing because, he's like, rushing it, it was it. a rush job. And he's like, man, I'm just doing this shit, and it was just for a movie. Boom. Yeah, right. So. Because you have to think that this was, I mean, he was a genius and he had been working for, you know, Grumman Aeronautics. He had been working mm -hmm. for JPL. He had been working like in these high ranking kind of positions. Yeah. And then because of the shit that he was doing outside yeah. of work, he thought that shit was beneath him. He got fired and blackballed. Yeah. So it might have been, and he kind of got forced into starting his own business, working in the movie. So he might have thought it was bullshit. Yeah, like you said. That's what I think. And he wasn't really like he wasn't taking the job seriously. Right. He wasn't really at the top of his game. Right. Um. I'm not. I don't think that it's completely out of bounds to say it was suicide either. I mean, because like I said, many of his uh, friends and family said that he was he had been depressed, which wasn't crazy like you know considering all that it yeah, happened but depression doesn't mean suicide he may have been depressed because he was in what he thought was a shitty job that was beneath him he wasn't really taking the job too seriously he was kind of rushing through it and boom blew himself up yeah that's what i think happened 
But that's like, that's crazy that that fucking happened. I've done shit like that. Fucking gone, tried to rush through jobs that I didn't think were seriously and serious and fucked them up. Didn't blow myself up, but fucked up what I was working on. Because well, I wasn't, that's the really, thing. It's wasn't like, really respecting the job, you know? Well, and I feel like, and, and I feel like, like I said, I'm not a big believer in conspiracy theories. I feel like you need to have a lot of evidence to support that kind of shit because people are just people. They make mistakes. Even people that are really accomplished, like, yes, he was very good at mixing explosive. Yes, he did know a lot about chemistry. Yes, he did. But everybody can make a mistake. Everybody can drop something. Everybody can, like, their hand can slip or they can trip or something like that. That can happen to anybody. So I don't think just that is enough well, to say. An assassination is not a conspiracy theory. An assassination is an assassination. Right. Right. Was this guy assassinated? No, he wasn't a high value target. No. He'd have been, he was out of the game. There was no reason to kill him. You know what I mean? Yeah. If he's a, he's a communist, so the FBI is going to kill him, he's out of the game. He's not doing anything important. He's working for the fucking movies. You know what I mean? And the thing they is, I, want that dude dead. I feel like out. it would be more in the line of the FBI or the government to more like discredit him. Yeah. They just, because they would probably him. think like, Oh, well yeah. he was into like sex magic and yeah. like, you know, I, they should probably play that up Yeah, because then if he talked, nobody would believe him. Assassinating somebody's called wet work. And really the FBI, the CIA or the FBI or the KGB Intel agencies, they did that as a, as a thing, a last resort. They didn't have to do that. Like you said, it's easier to discredit somebody or to ignore somebody. Yeah, to just say that they're like a up, lunatic. Yeah, or, or whatever. To fuck up their That's much easier. It's so much easier to like fuck up their income or to plant a fucking bogus story about them. You know, this is killing them really. It, 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 it's kind of productive because it fucking it, it attracts too much attention. Yeah, like you said, it's like it, that would seem like the yeah. the ultimate last resort. It's the last resort. So whenever somebody, and I'm not saying they don't kill people because they kind of like the the child island man that did not kill himself. It was a last resort. He was in custody. Well, yeah, they but killed like, that dude though. But like just I said, saying. I feel like it's so much easier yeah. to just, just and particularly with Jack Parsons because, and I'm not saying that he brought it on himself because obviously he didn't, but because he had such unconventional beliefs, it would have been very easy to discredit him in the eyes of the public in the way that no one would listen to him because they just thought he was a loon. So why go to the trouble of killing him and potentially getting caught or potentially getting in trouble? He wasn't working on anything important anyway. He wasn't important. Well, yeah, at this point he had yeah. been blackballed. Yeah. Um, and he wasn't working. I mean, he had started his own company. He was just working in the movies. He wasn't yeah. working on any military. He was out of the game. Yes, he did know some secrets about the shit, which is why some people still thought that he was murdered because he did know a lot of the shit because he was in, you know, he was in on the ground floor essentially of NASA because he was right there, like, you know, in the early days of like them developing the rockets and stuff. That wouldn't have been important. But I do feel like by the time that he died, yeah. Um, I feel like that information probably would have been so right. widely disseminated that yeah. it wasn't really, that there wasn't anything that he would have known that wouldn't have been known by someone else. Exactly. Maybe is, you know what I'm saying? Exactly. I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just saying it's unlikely. Usually when they knock somebody off, it has nothing to do with what they know in terms of technology. It's what they know about a certain powerful person that they don't want to come out. It, it, it usually has to do with possible criminal charges against somebody else. That's usually what, what what's happened. Yeah. And this is not a new phenomenon. There were dudes that got knocked off or suspected to get knocked off all the way back in the seventies. They had a dude who was a reporter who was trying to, he, he was wanted to write a book. I think it was called the octopus. And he, he had a theoretical, he had a theoretical situation where government and military and fucking corporations and organized crime, a place in which they would all meet. In other words, you know what I mean? A place where powerful men or an organ, you know what I mean? That powerful men were doing fucking bad things with organized crime and government. What he's talking about is what you would call today, like the deep state. Well, he was found dead fucking in a hotel bathtub. That was on Unsolved Mysteries. He was writing, oh, a, yeah, book I remember that. He was writing a book about it. It was 70s, wasn't it? 
70s or 80s. As far like, as that, yeah. They something. never fucking resolved that case. Well, he was asking fucking questions. And that can happen. You know? Did he kill himself or did somebody kill him? Because they made it look like a suicide. It's, But that's what intel agencies do. They make things look ambiguous. Yeah. When they get you. Well... This guy blowing himself up is not very ambiguous. If they were to kill him, they would have killed him another way. Although you could argue that if they were going to kill him, that seemed like the best way to kill him because that would be the way that would be most likely to look like an accident because that was the line of work that he was in. I would say, and they, he was always blowing shit up. I would say they would have killed him with a drug overdose or an alcohol overdose, or because he did do that, too. or they would have hit him with a car, something like that. Or they would have run his car off the road. Something like that. Something a lot less dramatic. Something that could be like, well, he was drunk and he did that. Yeah. Because that's usually what they do. Yeah, they run you off the road. They run you off road. <laughs> or they crash your car, you know. <clears throat> Which, I don't know. Like, I don't know how I feel about it. It's kind of like... Like I said, you know, were there reasons they would have wanted him dead? Probably, I don't think so. but not enough. Not enough to. And I kind of feel like because he worked with explosive chemicals all the time, because that was his line of work, um, it would be very easy to just like slip up one time. And and the thing is, you work in explosives, you slip up one time, you're dead. So. I don't know. So I so I feel like there's not really enough evidence. I know some some of his friends do feel like they killed him because and honestly, certainly the FBI did watch him from yeah. the 1940s. They admitted that later on. He was under surveillance by them. And um, you know, he had said that he thought he was under surveillance yeah. and they thought he was nuts, but he actually was. They admitted that later. Um, so I get that. He was under surveillance, he was under suspicion for being a spy, for being a Marxist, for being whatever. But, you know, was it enough to kill him at this late stage? I doubt it. Yeah. I, I kind of feel like it was probably just an accident or maybe it was suicide. Could have been because he did. I mean, his dad um, did suffer from depression, did suffer from those types of like mental issues, and he might have inherited those. So I do feel like there might be some, and like I said, he had gone through a lot of shit in his life, like losing his wife, losing his job, blah, blah, blah. So it might have been a kind of thing where he just said, fuck it, I'm out. Mm. Um, but do I think he was murdered? I doubt it. No. Nah. I doubt it. It's not impossible, but I doubt it. No, nah, yeah, there's not enough there. Now, it's it's interesting because I feel like for a while, because the weird thing about Jack Parsons is that even though he was like this monumental figure in founding the jet propulsion laboratory, which was like the basis of NASA. And he was like a huge figure in rocket science and, you know, the, the propulsion systems, the shit they used to get to the moon, even though he didn't live to see it, sadly. So even though he was like instrumental in that, I feel like they were kind of embarrassed of him for a long time because of the occult shit. Yeah. Because so... Like NASA, like well, he was a young dude too. He was. I he mean, was only thirty-seven when he yeah. died. So, so NASA, like they named a crater on the moon after him. Yeah. But it was a crater that was like on the dark side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it was always kind of like liked it though. Probably. Yeah, I yeah. It's like I kind of yeah. feel like he would have thought that was amusing. But in some ways, like in hindsight, you can see that it's just like, oh well, you want to like say that it's like oh awesome but we're gonna like hide you over here so yeah. you know what i mean it did kind of seem like that yeah but it does seem like in the past few years he's kind of got a little bit of a renaissance like i said in uh i believe it was 2014 please correct me if i'm wrong could have been earlier but there was a book that came out called strange angel which was about him and there was actually a um series that was based off of that it was fictionalized but it was based on his life and it's on uh, CBS All Access, uh, you know, the streaming service. And they did two seasons of it, which I believe was 2017 and 2018, which was also called Strange Angel. And it was about him. I haven't seen it, but I've heard it was pretty decent. I'd like to read the book as well, because he seems like a really fascinating character. 
but you know so it it does seem like in the last few years there's been like a new appreciation of him and honestly when i when i search youtube for shit about this guy it seems like he's almost better known for the occult shit than he is for the rocket science shit and i'm not really sure how to feel about that <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, I feel like everyone's into like, oh, he was into like Thelema and all that, but they kind of forget about. Uh, I think people are just kind of fixated on him because he was into both rockets and fucking the occult. Because that is unusual. And he knew, sure. he knew LRH and he blew himself up. That's that's really what it's all about. But he was an interesting guy. He was a young guy. You know what I mean? Yeah. They were experimental dudes. This was cutting edge shit. And uh, his interpretation of the paranormal was like fucking quantum quantum physics and quantum yeah. theory which is actually that kind of lines up with some of the shit that i believe with fucking with fucking you know poltergeist and the quantum soul theory and stuff yeah so but you can put quantum in front of anything and sound fucking special nobody knows what it is there's just there's just more fucking to science than what we know science is just a tool we don't understand everything yet i mean i feel like the we're mind just... has an ability to fucking somehow fuck with reality kind of like schrodinger's cat you know what i mean uh, perception has something to do with it well i mean i feel like i see reality as like this big impenetrable mountain and you're just kind of like chipping away at it yeah. like a little bit at a time yeah like you know we know a lot more than we did like 100 years ago 200 years ago but we still have like a long way to go reality might be not be as real as we think it is it might be a holographic kind of reality you know there's a bunch of different theories higher Although, dimensions here's the stuff. thing though like i'm kind of like i've read a lot of shit about this whole like the whole matrix thing like maybe everything's a hologram but even if it was like what what would the point of that be like what action could we take i think they're just talking would there about be any like I think what they're just talking about practical is, application of knowing that information. Yeah, you might be able to cheat. You might be able to cheat space and time. You might be able to cheat fucking mass and energy. You know, the uh, what what they're saying is that mass and energy may not be as real as you think it is, or you might be able to affect the reality of mass and energy. You know, like what makes a particle have mass? Is there another? Is there some kind of little subatomic particle that makes? A fucking atom have mass. Can you get rid of that particle and make mass massless? You know, it's this is all the shit that they're doing. Me and you can't do it. We don't have particle colliders and accelerators and shit. And and you know, it's a fucking very complicated science. And they still don't know everything yet. So that's one. Just, honestly, that's one of the things that frustrates me the most is that I'm kind of one of those people. It's like I want to know like all the shit. And I feel like too much weird shit. About that's how, what I mean. I will never know all the shit. I'll die before they figure they, this shit you know, out. There, there, there's that's a bummer. You think that a, that a piece of matter can only be in one place at a time, and it's not true. Something can bilocate. That a, that a, a, a subatomic particle can be in two different places at the same time. They've proven it. You know, even though it's a sub, it's a it's just a fucking atom. That's what know? I mean. Reality is like so super weird. So, you know, and what that means is, and then there's fucking spooky action at a distance, which, you know, they don't really understand that D distance or in other words, space may not be as real as you think it is. At least, And they know there are also higher dimensions and that there are more dimensions and that the universe possibly came from the collapse of fucking dimensions. And I'm gonna let them worry about it. I don't know. I kind of like hope that I live long enough to yeah. like for them to figure some of this shit out. It means that eventually they might be able to make shit like anti gravity, or they might be able to make shit like teleportation, or they might I'm be able to make. I'm holding out for teleportation. Or they might be able to make things like time travel. Maybe only into the future. I doubt the past, but maybe in the future. You know what I mean? Like, who you the fuck wants to, to go to the past anyway? I don't. Well, if you went to the past, you could change things. And that yeah. might be interesting. That's interesting. So, you know, there's a bunch of shit that you might be able to figure out. Free energy or cheating and getting energy out of nothing. Bunch of different. For energy. some reason, the thing that I am most into is teleportation. Yeah. People, we need to get on teleportation. That would fucking revolutionize everything. Yeah. And but, ever since I was a kid, I was like, yeah, we need to figure out how to do that. All right. So let's shut the show down. Ready to shut it down? 
Have we really been going almost They've gone four for almost hours? Four years, yeah. Four, four hours. Four years. Four years. It only feels like four years. Four hours. <laughs> it only feels like yeah. four years because I had tequila instead of vodka. Yeah. And I'm just like, in a way that was good because it made me drink it slower because mm. it tastes funny. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, okay. So kind of Aslan says, I need a sports almanac. Yeah, I know. All right, yeah. so we've been going on almost four hours. We're probably both super inebriated. Yeah, and at I got to take point. a break. <laughs> so go ahead and shut this down, Jen. <laughs> All right. So we hope you enjoyed the show about Jack Parsons, which was mostly about Jack Parsons, I think. I mean, from what I can remember. It was about everything. <laughs> <laughs> that's what this show is. You just get information on every conceivable topic, even when you weren't even expecting that. So uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Thank you all for stopping by. Thanks everyone for their donations. And remember, if you like the show, please like share, subscribe on all yep. your social media. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to the show, uh, please drop by our Patreon page, patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast. And uh, we give like early access to some of the shows like fucking movie reviews and various things of that nature. Um, or you can give a donation through PayPal if you would like to do that. And uh, that'll do it for episode 207. The hurricane has not hit us yet. Not yet. We'll no. see how it's going. It's only 847 PM. Yep. <laughs> so it might hit sometime at night. We might get hit by a tornado, but uh <laughs> Anyway, we'll see you guys uh, probably tomorrow. We'll probably live stream tomorrow. We're going to do a movie review tomorrow. So uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye. Oh, man. That's it.